Sup, freaks. It's your boy Marty here. Rubbing out the uh, the eye boogies, getting ready for this Wednesday morning. Um, here to introduce this week's episode of Tales from the Crypt. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, had the pleasure of sitting down again with Jeff Andrew. And this time, uh, we didn't really talk about Bitcoin too much. We definitely touched on it a little bit. But uh, the focus of this episode is uh, Jeff's essay that he wrote about a month and a half ago called A Post-Capitalist Future. Uh, triggered a lot of people in the uh, Austrio libertarian Bitcoin space, um, uh, but I, I thought it was an interesting paper again, and that's why I brought Jeff on here is because uh, in the first episode, if you freaks remember, we talked a lot about the economic philosophy of distributism, which is something that was new to me at the time, and I think this paper is an elaboration on the thoughts that we talked about in that episode, and then uh, expands on that. So I brought Jeff back to again expand on this topic. Because this is an economic philosophy again that I'm I'm a bit ignorant to, so I wanted to learn uh, learn about and uh, genuinely explore because I think it's an interesting idea. I am definitely sympathetic towards the ideals of the ideas that uh, Jeff is striving towards. I'm not so sure on the implementation and how to reach those ideals. It, it's still very uh, very uh, it's very much of a mystery to me how that would be implemented and. I'm still skeptical that it could be implemented without a lot of coercion. But nevertheless, again, this is a an exploration of uh, an economic philosophy and an idea. And I think it was a, a very thorough expo- uh, ther- uh, exploration. And I think you freaks are going to like it. We talk uh, a lot about a lot of stuff. Mentioned, we talk a lot about Marxism, socialism, the difference between socialism, social democracy, um, and capitalism. And... Uh, talk about a growing trend i mean uh, we talk about it towards the end of the episode but there is a growing trend of uh, people uh, being more sympathetic to the ideas that jeff is putting out there too if you're really paying attention um so this week's episode of tales from the crypt is brought to you by the cash app as you freaks already know cash app is the simplest way to send and save money and the simplest way to stack sats all right and now it's the simplest way to try to grow your money introducing cash app investing unlike investing tools that only let you buy entire shot entire s- slivers of shares or entire stonks cash app is instantly uh, allowing you to invest as little or as much as you want this way when your favorite company stock is just a little too expensive you can still own a little piece with as little as one dollar and because cash app is directly connected to your bank account there are no four to five day waiting periods for inbound transfers you're going to be able to start investing today all right you can start investing in sats all right you don't all you freaks out there in my mentions like oh why are they having stocks? Like, why are you why, why are you doing stocks in your ad reads? Hey, it's in the ad read. And two, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. The option is there. This, you can still stack sats and send them off the app if you want to. All right? Brokerage services are provided by Cash App Investing, a subsidiary of Square and member SIPC. As always, all right, use the code stacking sats. Spread this code out there. If you know somebody doesn't have the Cash App, go to them. Be like, yo, use the code stacking sats. Um, You're going to get $10, and then there's this dope uh, lacrosse charity in Chicago called Owls Lacrosse. (laughs) Cash App's going to send $10 to them, too. You're going to help them out, all right? So go download the Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today and enjoy this episode with Jeff Vandrew. I know I certainly did. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here on a Tuesday afternoon, mid-afternoon, close to the evening. It's 4.15. Uh, sitting down uh, with somebody who's already been here before. About to have a very interesting conversation. Welcome back to Jeff Vander. Jeff, what's going on? Great to be back, man. Thanks. Dude, thanks for taking the trip. You got it. Uh, we scheduled this podcast on Friday night while we were at... Uh, Hill Country? Hill Country Barbecue. Hill Country Barbecue, yeah. yeah. Yeah, great night uh, saying goodbye to Pierre Rochard. Great night and a sad night. Got to catch up with a lot of people that I hadn't seen in a while, uh, but also obviously very sad that I'm not going to see Pierre all the time now. Yeah, man, he gave a very heartfelt speech. Pierre was uh, the first Bitcoin friend. He was my first friend in Bitcoin. Until I met Pierre, as I mentioned that night, I was just, you know, I was... I held Bitcoin. I read about Bitcoin. I even had Bitcoin as a small part, back then only as a small part of my business. But I was just a man on an island out there in New Jersey. Didn't really have any friends who were uh, particularly involved with it. 
Did you reach out to him? So we met at uh, the inaugural BitBlock Boom Conference in Dallas, which is funny because we didn't even meet here in the New York area. Uh, and then I just happened to have been talking to him while I was there and he mentioned he lived in Brooklyn and I was like, kind of like, oh, let's, you know, when we get back East, let's get together sometime, you know, this, this fall. And it just sort of took off from there. Yeah. And, uh, Pierre was one of the first, uh, Bitcoiners I met as well. I think I DM'd him. I forget if he DM'd me or I DM'd I think I DM'd him and we met here in like the East village, walked around, drank like meat broth talking about Bitcoin. And then, uh, I owe... I have a debt of gratitude to Pierre as well. Oh, a debt of gratitude to Pierre. Uh, he was the first guest on this podcast and a very good first guest. Yeah. And, well, I, this is actually, it's funny you mentioned you met him by DMing and this is going to sound really dumb, but like, I'm really glad that I started DMing people some years ago on Twitter because that's not like something I used to do. I just used Twitter very passively and just kind of like read it and, you know, but I didn't post that much. I didn't really comment in the replies on other people's stuff. And then I don't remember exactly why I started doing it, but I just started like jumping into people's replies and then sometimes even DMing people. And uh, honestly, it's been a huge positive. I've like made friends that way. Yeah, no, it's um, a lot of people like to use LinkedIn as a social networking tool or excuse me, a professional networking tool. I think Twitter is uh, far be far superior as a networking tool. I have absolutely never gotten a client from LinkedIn. I've gotten many, many clients from Twitter. All right, because you can, again, the conversation aspect, you can see via likes, retweets, and replies. Uh, yeah, and it doesn't have that whole, LinkedIn is so transactional where everyone's just like, wants something from you all the time. Like, I've never gotten a direct message on LinkedIn that wasn't somebody like asking for something, right? Like, I've never gotten a message on LinkedIn that just said, hey, what do you think about this? Or, hey, this is pretty cool. Or, hey, I just wanted to say I enjoyed this. Never. It's always like... You know, they want some sort of a very transactional relationship where things on Twitter, I feel, are a lot more natural. Yeah, I know Reed Hoffman is a Bitcoin bull, right? Um, I believe so. Oh, I mean, it's Microsoft now that's run it, that's got LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. Post, uh, it's a post Reed Hoffman world. But anyway, I deleted my LinkedIn a while ago. I could have yeah, taken it. I still have it, but, you know. I, I hated know. that transactional nature and the content was terrible and it was. Yes, LinkedIn content is the, the most trite. Con- I mean, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't know how bad Facebook is. But compared to Twitter, LinkedIn content is extremely trite, like stupid motivational memes and things like that. It's all copy pasta, too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, but back to uh, Pierre being the first uh, guest on this, just bring, bring that episode up. Somebody was mentioning it this week. It's stood the test of time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He uh, was very prescient in there, a lot of, a lot of good quotes, and actually... Speaking of that first episode, we we talked a lot about human action, and I'm staring at the book right now. I finally picked up the 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 physical copy of Human Human Action. I'm going to start trying to do back to back cover cover coverage of this book after seeing Connor Brown jump into it a couple weeks ago. So I read Human Action a while back, and I actually reread it. Re- well, I didn't reread read the whole thing. I went back and kind of looked back at my notes on it with regard, actually, in preparation for this podcast because. Parts of it are actually going to come up in some stuff we're discussing later. Um, So I think that'll all kind of tie in there. It's kind of good that you grabbed a physical copy. Yeah, it's all coming. Hey, if we need to cite anything, we can pull it. We can pull it right out. We can pull it right out. All right, here. I'm going to put it on the coffee table (laughs) just in case. It's going to be a loud thing. God, it is a a monster, isn't it? Let's see if the, uh, the mics can pick it up. Nah, you, Marty, for those who aren't here, which is, well, everybody other than me and Marty, that's a soft cover, so, you know, it didn't make a whole it's lot of noise. It's called a paperback cover. It's not necessarily soft. I mean, softer than a hard hard cover, yes, but... What is it? I actually do not know the distinction between a paperback and a soft cover. Neither do I. I never, I've always known it as a paperback. I've always thought they were the same thing, but I don't know. I've never heard soft cover. Maybe I just made it up in my head. This is very possible. Jeff, will you stop? It would not be the first time. Will you stop Mandela affecting our audience, please? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm just creating new vocabulary here. Yeah, apparently. All right. So let's jump into the the meat of why we're here. Your your post on uh, uh, post-capitalist world. I almost said anti-capitalist. Maybe it is anti-capitalist. Is it anti-capitalist? It's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, the main conceit that I have there... I don't even take a posi- a pro or anti position per se one way or the other. It's more so that uh, you know capitalism is sort of a transitory phase um, that essentially has to end because at, at the end of the sort of competitive market period, 
naturally capital tends to centralize in a few uh, a few players, right? And it will become an oligopoly in that event. All right. Before I jump in, yeah, with pushback and steel man, potentially some straw man. I might make fun of you at some point. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, let's just walk through the thought experiment. Let's like walk through the piece, yeah, structurally, if you can, from memory. Uh, sure. Um, and then we'll have a conversation about it. Yeah, no problem. So at the beginning, basically, I try to give, I, I kind of make the statement that economic systems sort of last only so long as you can sort of keep people under control, right? And the ex- the example I give was. Uh, you know, the USSR, that system, that sort of state communist system fell apart because it, at a certain after a certain period of time, it just wasn't it wasn't providing for its citizens as well as the capitalist system was. And the citizens knew it. So there were really two parts of that. Number one, um, people were missing out when they uh, as compared to what people in the West had, you know, economically. And number two, people were aware of it. That's a big part of it, too, because if you're in North Korea and you have no access to information, it doesn't matter how far behind you are because you you have no standard of comparison. You don't realize it. Exactly. Right. So and that's really what led to the events of 1989 uh, and then eventually, obviously, 1991 when the whole thing fell apart. So the point that I make in the piece is I sort of talk about, again, capitalism, not as a permanent economic system, but as a. Uh, phase of development is you, you more or less how I think about it. It's a phase that basically it's a phase of industrialization and perhaps is the only way that a society can industrialize. But at the end of that capitalist period, and when I say capitalism here, what I'm mostly referring to is the idea that you should have a market that it, no markets are perfectly free, but you're having a market that's pretty darn free. The, the, uh, the idea that you're striving for, the ideal, let's say, is to have a free market. And the, the first point that I make there is that eventually that free market, yes, it's very efficient. Yes, it's certainly the most efficient allocation of resources. Um, but if you let that be free for an indeterminate period of time, absent interruptions like wars or, uh, you know, there's a couple government interventions that have happened in the industrial era that I mentioned in the piece, eventually what happens is that capital all is going to centralize in the hands of a few small players. Or excuse me, well, they're large players, actually, I should say. Centralize in the hands of a few large players. And then once that happens, it's just going to be in those players' material interests uh, to form an oligopoly, right? To no longer compete with each other. In, instead, sort of, you know, mash out exactly who gets what, and then at that point, we sort of end up with a society where everyone is employed by a small group of employers. Those employers are also the only producers in society. So we, we don't have much choice, not only in terms of what we consume, but also in terms of how our just non-consuming lives are lived, right? Because we all spend so much of our time at work, um, and there wouldn't really be a competitive labor market in this situation. So where I got a lot of these ideas, um, partially from a book by Hilaire Bullock uh, that was written in the early 20th century called The Servile State. Also, his uh, follow-up book, which was called Economics for Helen, is, a, is the uh, sort of the sequel to The Servile State that expands upon it further. Um, and before I forget, actually, one of the more interesting uh, changes from Servile State to Uh, economics for Helen, is in Servile State, Bullock believed that essentially he was writing about England, and he believed that England would have never had this centralized capital problem in the first place if the king hadn't gotten involved, uh, taken over the church's monasteries, and redistributed them to to the big landlords. So essentially, Bullock was making the argument that absent government intervention, we never would have had this centralized capital in the first place. Um, by the time, what's interesting is 10 roughly years later, by the time economics for Helen, uh, comes around, he's no longer making that argument. Um, he doesn't explicitly refute the prior argument. It's just that when he talks about centralization of capital and economics for Helen, which as an interesting side note, Helen was his niece, uh, kind of a sweet fact or a cozy fact, let's say about the title there. He wrote it for his niece. Um, In Economics for Helen, he doesn't make that argument. He basically instead says that, yeah, the nature of, and this is the more persuasive argument to me, and we'll 
get into this later as we get more into the essay. But the more persuasive argument to me is government intervention or not, um, ultimately the nature of these things is that capital is going to centralize and, you know, regardless one way or the other. And unless there's sustained positive action to prevent that from happening, that's just the, essentially the fate, right? So Bullock believed that once capital became centralized, you know, you transitioned out of capital into this servile state system. And what's interesting in particular about the servile state is when you, when you throw that out there, people get in their heads this idea that it's like uh, it's almost like the experience we had with slavery in the United States, where violence is the way in which people are held in line. Right? Yeah, that I'm thinking like uh, feudalism. Yeah. Well, well, actually, what's funny is he talks about feudalism as being less servile because he thought the the serfs had. Uh, considerably more control over their day to day lives than a, even a, even an employee in early 20th century England uh, would have had. So at the time he was writing. So Bullock is saying in Economics for Helen that the natural market forces are such that capital will centralize and then that would lead to a natural servile state. Right, okay. right. And the servile state, it should be it should be mentioned. A big part of it, what starts to happen is that capital, and we've seen this in the 20th and 21st centuries, um, as capital starts to centralize, is it actually starts to offer workers more protections um, because it's really in their material interest to do so. You don't want those people, for instance, call, uh, you know, engaging in a communist revolution like we, like we saw throughout the 20th century. And uh, in order to do that, it kind of makes sense to structure law in such a way but the workers get some level of protection, and in exchange for that protection, they have to give up the right to ever be essentially what we would call today entrepreneurs. He doesn't use that word. Um, but to ever really be self-employed or self-sufficient or anything of that nature. And what's funny is, I mean, he's writing this book over 100 years ago, but one of the things he talks about that's obviously been something that we've had come into play in the 20th century, and I'm not even saying it was a bad thing, but was like the idea of social insurance programs that are tied to employment. Social Security, Medicare, yeah. You know. I mean, I would say it's probably a bad idea in the long run. Well, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, but even let's say even stuff that's a, that's a little bit less. Uh, yeah, Social Security. I mean, I could I certainly see the arguments against it. Let's let's even do something slightly less controversial, but still obviously that we're certainly going to have listeners that would oppose, um, like workman's comp insurance, right? The idea that like if you're a self-employed person, because uh, that's actually one of the he doesn't use that term. It didn't exist at the time, but one of the, one of his examples, um, you know, I don't have workman's comp protection because I'm self-employed, right? Like if I get hurt, like I just, that's something I have to plan for as an individual. But uh, if you're an employee, the law grants you certain workman's comp provisions. You're, you're covered for that sort of thing. So that's an idea. It's basically all these things that, that create this servile relationship and really he was talking about servility more in the in terms of the servile relationships that more ancient types of slavery had. And he goes through the history of that. I won't rehash all of that, but the idea that it was almost a paternal relationship between master and servant in exchange for that sort of that labor that was being provided. So and, and I think that regardless, I mean, we've definitely seen that part of his prediction come true. Right. Uh, I mean, the the amount worker protections have increased, you know, and they haven't and they haven't for the most part uh, in recent years been even to union tied protections. They've been directly from the government. They're not protections that were negotiated between, you know, with a union. You've got the employees. They form a cartel so that they can more effectively bargain with their employer. And, the, and you've got your employees and employer hash out an agreement that works for them, whereas with these more servile type relationships that are enforced at a government level has nothing to do with whether or not you're in a union or what you bargain for or anything of that nature, right? It, this, these are this these are designed specifically to sort of enforce that servile relationship between employer and employee. So his fear is that essentially this would have that all these things combined would create this mass centralization effect and we would never get out of it, right? Because these... Uh, these these legal changes that would 
that would definitely come in his eye, along with the centralization of capital, would also reinforce the system, right? People would not be motivated to try and break out of the system because it would sort of provide just enough. It's basically raising the floor. It creates a situation where you have a very, very distinct uh, capital class and proletariat class with really nothing in between. But you provide a high enough floor for the proletariat that you're not going to see a proletarian revolution. That's sort of the idea. Yeah, this seems to be the policy of many Western nations for the last three to four decades. Right? Exactly. And that's, by the way, uh, one of the major differences. And I try to make this point throughout. That's why, like, we're always fighting with Joe Eisenthal on Twitter. Like, the world's getting better, but, like... Right, exactly. It's like, it, yeah. is it really getting better? And we yeah. can. I've had a lot of Twitter arguments about that. We can get into later, but um, that's one of the key distinctions. One of the things I think you really need to understand to understand this piece is the key distinction between structural change, which of which distributism is a type, socialism is a type, versus non-structural change of which social democracy is a type. I make a very a uh, strong distinction in terms when I write and when I speak between socialism and social democracy. So social democracy is the idea that you provide welfare state type benefits for people that are designed specifically so that they will not question the overall structure of the economic system. It seems like just like a stepping stone to straight up socialism. See, I don't think it is. I think the reverse. I think it's actually designed. And one of the pieces I make in the point in the one of the points I make in the piece, excuse me, is I actually think social democracy is explicitly designed to be anti-socialist because it keeps con- <coughs> excuse me conditions just what just good enough for the workers that they're not sufficiently motivated to revolt the way they did in the Soviet Union in 1917, for example. Yeah, but how can you dictate that, even if under the guise of social democracy? Well, you're not dictating anything. All you're doing is you're just making people lazy. That's all you're doing. In other yeah, words, I mean, by, by raising their floor enough, you're, just, you're making people lazy. Yeah, you're not necessarily dictating production, right? Correct. But That's the it idea. seems like a way, like a stepping stone to get to that point, though. I just I, I don't agree. I think the idea is at, at the, the your worst case scenario there. Yeah, can people vote themselves more money? Theoretically, right? But if you are an important enough, if you are a large enough holder of capital, you have influence over democratic elections. Well, socially though, do you think it'll get to a point where there'll have there'll be conflict? Right, the welfare state just leads to natural social conflict because you have the capital owners basically subsidizing. Correct. The, most of that and they're like and they're i mean i think socially psychologically people are just gonna be like all right we're just paying all these taxes for these people to live on the dole and socially they're gonna be like they need to work for their money and they're gonna be like all right we'll dictate that they see i don't do think that stuff. at all and i think the stats bear me out on this okay. so the the largest proponent the you just look at there's a chart in the footnotes on my piece there if anyone wants to look at it uh the main proponents of social democracy in the United States are the wealthiest people. Uh, they love social democracy because it keeps it keeps the populace docile and under control and not agitating for structural change. Yeah, and let's be clear, you're not a fan of social democracy, are you? No, I'm not much of a fan of social democracy. I mean, I'm you know most of the people that would be listening to this podcast, and I'm pretty upfront about this. Um, would certainly consider me a statist. I'm nowhere near an anarchist. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what I believe uh, further in the, you know, as we go through the piece, why I think anarchism, I think it's a good first principle. Uh, I've read all the Austro-Libertarian stuff. I really don't quibble with it, but uh, with the with the underlying assumptions, but why I just believe that there are certain trade-offs. Um, you know, we'll get into that more later. But yeah, I, I, the, prob- the main problem I have with social democracy is that it's just designed to create this permanent servile class. Social democracy basically is block servile state, where people like me tend to more favor structural change, which uh, a real structural change doesn't just raise the floor for you know the servile class or... I use the term proletariat a lot. Um, I don't want people to think that that necessarily makes me an orthodox Marxist, distributist to use that term as well. Um, by you know raising the floor for the proletariat, really you're you're not making a structural change that would, for instance, 
change the number of people that are in the proletariat, make it easier for people to ascend out of the proletariat to, for instance, the petite bourgeoisie, change the ease of ascending out of the petite bourgeoisie to the halt bourgeoisie, right? I mean, uh, for those that are not familiar with those terms, the, those are those do originally come from uh, Marxist economics. Uh, proletarian is basically your basic working class. The petite bourgeoisie is people like me uh, who basically own businesses but have no real power because we don't have any substantial amount of capital. And then to use just the extreme example, like Jeff Bezos is in the the haute bourgeoisie, right? Um, that's sort of the the distinction there. And some people today also make a an, an additional distinction when they talk about modern society by adding a, a professional managerial class in there, um, which is sort of, because they don't really fit with the traditional idea of a petite bourgeoisie. Um, that's more people that are the sort of the handmaidens of the haute bourgeoisie. If you work for Amazon, for instance, uh, well, if you work in the warehouse, you're a, a proletarian. If you're working in the office, you're probably a, a part of the professional managerial class. So if I use those terms, um, like PMC, you know, through what I'm speaking here. Um, it's not necessarily an endorsement of orthodox Marxist theology. I just think it's a somewhat easy way to talk about different differing people's interests in an economic system. That's the only point I'm making. Goddamn Marxist. There you go. Are you a Marxist? I am not a Marxist. So, uh, but, you know, if you read, I'm, I'm a localist above all else, but. which, which means I, uh, I, uh, I, I very much value local control over almost any economic system. I look at economic systems in a very utilitarian way in terms of what's going to provide the most local levels of control. So I'm a very heterodox thinker. Uh, we'll get more into that. And my beliefs are very heterodox and pulled from all over the place. Um, distributist thought has definitely had a huge influence on me. Distributists, we talked about that a little bit the first time I was on. But it's, uh, it's an economic system opposed to both capitalism and socialism. Uh, the distributist writers were pretty big cr critics of both of those systems. Um, distributist writing tends to be a little dated, however. It was just written in a different era when industrialization had not progressed to the point that it had now. So I'd be lying if I said that there weren't um, elements of things like syndicalism that I think are valuable. Um, we'll kind of get into that, I guess, as we go along as well. But no, I'm definitely not an orthodox Marxist. Uh, Marxist would be offended uh, by probably uh, by me say, if I were to say that I was. Um, yeah, so I don't remember where we were before we got off on that tangent. Um, and we were just uh, basically putting these into silos. Uh, okay, Social right. democracy, Marxism. Yes, okay, so... And if you forward. talk to, and this is confusing, and one of the reason why, reasons why the whole social democracy, socialism, I think distinction is so confusing, and even if you're a person that strongly opposes both systems, I think it's very worthwhile to understand the differences. Um, and by the way, I'm also aware that people that are uh, students of praxeology tend to uh, classify both of those systems all as socialism, but they make distinctions between sort of different types of socialism, right? That's my understanding of praxeology works that way. In fact, praxeologically, if you look at the Austrians, um, what they believed, essentially almost every economic system is socialism that exists in the real world, um, not the ones that they would necessarily favor, um, but that all that's essentially the way they categorize things. I'm using the social democracy term just because to people who haven't necessarily studied, you know, Austrian economics or praxeology, it just is probably a little bit more of a familiar term, right? So anyway, in terms of that distinction, um, and where was I going there? <laughs> Social democracy, why I think it's so important. I think it's important to understand because it people's motivations for the two are different. And the reason why I think it's very confusing is in if you just like were to like read political you know current political discourse it's extremely confusing for a variety of reasons number one in europe all the parties that call themselves socialist today are in fact social democratic they've long ago abandoned uh actual socialism right i mean the uh classic example is the labor party in britain literally removed uh, socialization of the means of productions from their party platform in the 90s. Like that, there's no more clear sign than that, right? So all those parties have that have socialist in their names have generally moved towards social democracy. So that's confusing. 
Number two, in the United States, we misuse categorizations all the time, mostly as insults in political discourse. So liberal takes on this bizarre, twisted meaning. Socialist mm. takes on this bizarre, twisted meaning. You libtard. Yes, exactly. So socialist in the United States has sort of taken on this idea of like a very liberal social democrat, which is very odd because people that are actually orthodox Marxists and consider themselves real socialists and have actually read socialism and, and you know, taken a glomming to it, just not some kid on the internet, find that almost laughable because socialism is an illiberal ideology. Um, so it's sort of bizarre. So that confounds the whole distinction as well. And I only mention this now at the beginning just so that it gives a better, better understanding of where why I make this distinction between social democracy and socialism and why I think they have very different motivations. As I said, you know, your, your large holders of capital, and again, the stats bear this out, are very supportive of social democracy. They would be much less supportive of actual socialism. In other words, socializing the means of production. Like they're for obvious reasons, they're not going to support giving up their you know their ownership of these large enterprises, which is what socialism essentially is. Okay, so we laid the landscape of we our, laid the landscape right of our of our choices here, and let's. And we're still on block or uh, block block. Yeah. Um, so at the, at any at any rate. At this point in the piece, I sort of talk, I, I've sort of made my case as to why I think capital centralizes. One very important thing I think to keep in mind, if you're skeptical of what I'm saying, is I think a lot of people do not consider the extreme effects that industrialization has had on society and on economics. So a lot of the early pro-free market thinkers like Adam Smith lived in a less industrialized era where economies of scale were much, 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 much less. I mean, even if you disagree with everything else I'm saying today, I think that should be a pretty non-controversial statement. So that's flipped a lot of those arguments on their head. I'll give you a, a classic example. Smith thought that free trade, for instance, in his, in his day, all the large holders of capital hated free trade. Free trade was considered like a leveling mechanism. It put, it would actually discourage centralization because it would bring more competition in, right? That's generally not the way things work today, right? Even if you're a big free trade proponent because you believe it's more efficient, increases wealth, it certainly doesn't increase competition, right? It, it actually has had the effect of decreasing competition because all... and. The reason that we know that is if you assume global corporations aren't stupid, which I assume that they're not stupid for anything else, they all universally support free trade um, because it essentially allows them to have influence across the entire globe instead of only in one country, right? So that's one example of where just even the motivations for different economic arguments have been flipped on their heads by the change in economies of scale due to industrialization. Um, there's a good book, by the way, that gives a history of this that probably almost everyone that is listening is going to hate, but I'm going to, I, I have a compulsive thing where I have to give attribution to where I get ideas from. Um, Elizabeth Anderson wrote a great book called, uh, private government. And, uh, the reason why I said a lot of our listeners probably won't like it. Elizabeth Anderson is a, f a professor of feminist philosophy at the university of Michigan. Um, and very much, uh, I believe, and I hope I'm, I doubt she's listening, but I apologize if I'm mischaracterizing your views, Professor Anderson, um, but very much a social Democrat uh, and, and very much a liberal. So we probably ne wouldn't necessarily agree on much, but the best part of the book is the first, first of all, two interesting things about the book. Uh, number one, before I get into how it ties to our concept here, the format of the book is incredibly interesting in that she makes her case in two chapters. The next three chapters are her critics, three different people, one of which is Tyler Cohen, who probably most uh, of our listeners are familiar with. Um, basically, He's becoming more liberal, too. Yeah, but basically criticize her work um, from different angles. Two of them were historians, and then Tyler is an economist. And then the final chapter of the book is her responding to her critics. So I thought, if nothing else, that was a kind of a cool uh, way yeah, to set a cool up structure. your book. Yeah, yeah to your book. But for our purposes here, what's interesting about the book is the first chapter is actually entirely a history of the early pro-market thinkers, and then it sort of goes into what their motivations were and how it was all flipped on its head by industrialization, as I sort of uh, you know mentioned earlier on. So I guess 
to get back to walking through the piece, you know, at that point, I thought I feel like I've sort of made my case that um, at the end of the day, capital capitalism sort of has to be this transitory thing because because at the end, if you just let it go unimpeded, where you end up is capital becomes very centralized. The centralized holders of capital are going to have immense power. It's in their material interests to collude with each other um, and essentially form their own society. And the last point that I make there is that this, in my opinion, happens with or without a government. So one of the big pushbacks I got on this point in the piece was that, well, if we all if we didn't have a government or we had a much weaker government, that this wouldn't happen, right? This collusion would be much more difficult. And at the end of the day, the reason I don't think that is... I believe that the holders of capital use government as a colluding mechanism because it's available. Uh, if it weren't available, they would just use a different mechanism. Um, in other words, right now, government is available. It's the easiest way to accomplish their goals. But there's no reason to think that in a country that has, I don't know, five or ten employers, those five or 10 employers wouldn't get together and impose some sort of social insurance system just to keep people from getting, from being, uh, you know, disruptive, you know, for that same reason that I talked about in our discussion of social democracy, where you want to push up the floor, it would be in their material interest to do so. Yeah. But the government acts is like if the government didn't exist, would, right, they wouldn't have regular. Like the, I'm thinking of banking right now. Like, okay, how hard is it to start a bank, and why is that? Is it banking is an in, a really interesting right? One. Like how hard is it to start a bank? And I, I wasn't why is that? Get into this is it because until, of until later licensing, accreditation, all that stuff? Like, would it be easier to start a bank without government? I think so. In the short term, right? Well, actually, banking is really interesting because it's, it controls the money. Right. So let me use a different example first before we go to banking. Okay. And then we'll get really wild. Uh, so imagine just your general uh, production of consumer goods, right? Or sale of consumer goods or whatever. That that's all set. Actually, you know, let me tell This is a better way to approach it. Take banking out of the equation. Just consider the rest of the economy. You've uh, Amazon's the only retailer, let's say, or Amazon and Walmart are the only retailers. Um, they're probably manufacturing at that point a good number of the goods as well because why wouldn't they once uh, everyone else has been eliminated? There's a few other manufacturers, let's say, uh, involved in these in these in these goods. We have a small number of employers, this small economy, but the number of employers and produ- which are also the producers in society is small enough that they're actually pretty easily able to collude with one another. Right? They can set regulations. Um, they, like I said, they can even implement a social insurance system voluntarily, you know, and that could just be in the form of, we agree to provide all our employees this, we're going to raise prices by X percent in order to, uh, accommodate that. And that's basically a tax, you know, but in that event where you're in a monopolistic or oligopolistic system, that's really not, uh, distinctly different from a tax. So, it, let's say it's all in their interest to do so. Well, what what also is in their interest to do so? I very much think that uh, controlling the monetary system is is in their in- interest to do so because they are the large recipients. They essentially determine what types of currency are accepted versus not accepted. And one thing that didn't come into my mind until it's not in the piece because I didn't think of this until later. But fiat currency is essentially an inevitable. Uh, an inevitable end game of that whole system, right? Because once, if you have a small number of producers and a small number of employers, they're the ones that are going to determine in the society what currency is accepted and what's not. Why wouldn't they just collude together and form their own central bank? Uh, And if you think that's crazy, right, a central bank that issues a currency that they accept and they control the supply of, if you think that's nuts, I mean... You can, I would say, Mr. Robot, if anybody watches that television series, made exactly the point that I just made. That's a scenario where essentially they all colluded together to create ecoin, right? Yeah, but yeah, now the Bitcoin exists. Like this all seems like well, a that's that's where I was going, yeah. right? So, in other words, one of the reasons why I care about Bitcoin and I'm involved in it is I believe that it's a grand decentralizing factor. In other words. Well, I th- we'll come back to this, but my interest in Bitcoin is not necessarily 
to create an anarchist society or, or anything even in that ballpark. It's that I believe it has... I don't believe it's the only solution to decentralizing capital, but I think it very much cuts in that favor, and that's why I have an interest in it. When I talked about you know central banking sort of being the inevitable conclusion of this system, where I was eventually going with that was that you know until the technology came about that allows us to have Bitcoin, I believe that that was the case, right? I don't believe even today in our current system, let's not even just do pie in the sky stuff. I don't believe the Federal Reserve exists and has its power because like some schlubs that got elected to office just dreamt it up in their heads. It has that power because it's a concerted effort. Correct. It was a concerted effort. And who really pulls the strings on that stuff? It's the largest holders of capital because it's in their interest Uh, to have fiat currency. So that's my point when I'm talking about the inevitability of fiat coming to fore in a, you know, in a free market competitive capitalist system. This is why that would happen. Uh, 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 And and that's why it did happen. And this kind of goes to a larger point that I want to make here, the two that's going to come back later. When the government does something that you think is bad, a lot of people tend to look at it and say, oh, well, it's because of, you know, uh, it's because of, like, they think of the government as this separate entity that has its own ideas. No. When the government does something that screws people over, more than likely, it's because large holders of capital directed that to happen, because they're the ones that are financing these elections. Your politicians are really only accountable to two groups, right? They're accountable to their voters, and they're accountable to the capital holders, right? Because they get money from the capital holders and they get votes from the voters, right? So more often than not, and now this might be starting to change now with the democratization of information that we've seen, but through for most of my life, the holders of capital were more important than the voters, right? Holders of capital may also be voters, but they're like one vote. A billionaire only has one vote, but he has a tremendous amount of capital. Uh, so he obviously is going to carry more influence. Tremendous amount of free speech with that capital. Correct. Exactly. So that's sort of, you know, democratization of information, I believe, has been a good thing for that reason. But before that mm-hmm. happened, imagine when you only had a few television channels, right? Like this is this is a tremendous amount of power. I think it's a folly to assume there's this... What, honestly, what I think is a crazy idea that that government is constantly, you know, at loggerheads with big business. Oh, they're fighting with each other. And if only the government got out of the way, business could flourish. No, I think that's completely wrong. They're very much on the same page. And any appearance to the contrary is essentially controlled opposition. Um, Whoa, to really? Make, to make it appear so. Yeah, I, I feel pretty confident in that, that that's that that's how our system works, which is. Why, again, we're going to keep coming back to this. I think the most positive thing you can do in terms of forming a society is creating a system in which capital is decentralized rather than rather than centralized. Decentralized capital creates more stakeholders. It's really just that simple. Well, and that's why I'm like so confused. What did it enable like the, the capitalist uh, utopian competitive society that we envision? Not utopian, but... You- what, Bitcoin? Yeah, like the sound money. Like you say, all these capitalist systems uh, eventually devolve into uh, central banking fiat run, run, not devolve. They eventually get to a point where the holders of capital create central banks and create a fiat system, which enslaves the people via inflation. If Bitcoin takes that away and doesn't allow uh, the capital controllers to do that, like does that curb them to a certain extent and, and induce their failure? quicker therefore making the capitalist feedback loop go quicker as well yeah i mean it certainly cuts in that direction and that's why uh you know i in fact sorry if that was an ineloquent uh, no no it cuts in that direction and that's why look that's why i'm involved with bitcoin i mean that's one of the points i want to make is like sometimes i say these things and people are like well why would you give a crap about bitcoin then if you think all these things and it's like well specifically because i think it's a decentralizing factor for all it at very minimum right doesn't allow uh centralized holders of capital to control the money supply so they're not going to get to benefit from the cantillon effect another giant centralizing factor so it's it is a fact it is at a minimum a factor that cuts in favor of decentralization over centralization if that makes sense okay so if not a capitalist system run on sound money what what do you envision 
the transition in a post-capitalist world. Yeah, so at some point, right, here's what I think is going to happen. So the my hope, if we were able to transition into a servile state system, which the fiat system obviously aids that, right? I don't think it should be controversial to say that because... The servile state system rests on essentially what we call today social democracy, and that's much easier to do with fiat currency, right? Because you can just print more fiat currency, right? So Bitcoin may be our way to avoid that servile state system in that we you will not be able, as ca- I still think that capital is going to tend to centralize in the free market system, but you're not going to be able to placate the people at the bottom, right? So they're it, essentially... I guess a good way to phrase this would be without the ability to print fiat currency, I don't believe the large centralized holders of capital will be able to prevent a proletarian revolution. And my hope is that when I say that, that's not a violent one. It could be an electoral one. We still do have elections in the United States. Um, And the democratization of information cuts in favor of that as well, right? It also create it reduces the ability that these holders of capital have to influence elections. So if I'm right and Bitcoin essentially creates a situation where the servile state becomes difficult, if not impossible to implement, that that raises the next obvious question of what's next, right? So in other words, uh, if people are going to be, you know, we have this giant proletariat, uh, proletariat, excuse me, that's all riled up. Um, what is going to come next uh, from there? And my hope is that it's actually not a purely Marxist solution. And I uh, I know a lot of Marxists. I think they're actually really well-meaning people. Uh, it's probably going to be a controversial thing to say on this podcast, uh, even though I don't agree with their ideas. Uh, and oftentimes, I think a lot of people conflate the identity politics they see on television with Marxism when those two things are actually, in fact, very much at loggerheads. Uh, Orthodox Marxists hate identity politics more than you can imagine, probably more than anybody here does, because it gets in the way of their class-based politics. Um, and it's worth noting that, uh, uh, you know, it was actually the CIA that created identity politics. This is not a conspiracy theory. You can look up the Frankfurt School on Wikipedia and learn about that. So, yeah, CIA has been up to some shit for, some, for a few decades at exactly. least. Exactly. That said, now that I just, I've by now I've probably, you know, angered, infuriated everyone. No, I like this conversation. This is like an interesting but, conversation. Like think of alternative economic systems. Right. right. So my problem with, with Marxism is I believe it's utopian to believe that you could have a Marxist system without a dictator. Right. In other words, I, I, I don't see how you could have, you can respect people's human freedom uh, in a Marxist system. Although many people in a, in a, in a, at least at the end of the logical progression of a Marxist system, right. A, a purely, orthodox Marxist system. I know a lot of really well-meaning people that disagree with me on that point, but that's my belief. And you know what? I'm biased. My family came here from the USSR in 1917 to get away on one side of my family to get away from the revolution. So that's probably, you know, we all have our biases and that's probably part of mine. But moving on from that, let's say that, that I don't, my hope is that we don't have, uh, you know, we don't turn into the USSR, right? Um, necessarily in that in that situation. Um, I see a couple different ways you could go about it. Number one are distributist type solutions, right? And those are basically solutions based in positive law that are designed to tilt the balance uh, towards decentralization of capital away from centralization of capital. Um, and the interesting thing to note here in terms of Bitcoin is most of those solutions cost very little, if not nothing. So they're not really affected by the inability to print fiat currency. For instance, you can have an antitrust system that doesn't require a lot of funding. It doesn't require the same amount of funding as, as, you know, providing direct benefits to people, for instance, right? Um, So that makes, that's very much a possibility. Um, uh, you know, I give a couple examples there. Antitrust is one example. Is that imperfect? Absolutely, because you have to have human beings making decisions about, uh, you know, exactly what uh, what businesses need to be broke up. I'm I'm willing to take that trade off that people are going to make mistakes and there's going to be cronyism and stuff like that. If at least some people, you know, uh, if there's at least some decentralizing benefit there. 
Um, another point would be, you know, I think that businesses over a certain size um, should be mandated to have something in the ballpark of a German co-determination system. And what that, what that is for those that aren't familiar um, in Germany, and I, I'm not an expert on the German, I'm more, I know more about the way that I envision I would want to see it than I know about the way that it actually plays out in Germany. But essentially, once you have a business, in my mind, how this would play out, once you have a business that's large enough over a certain, you know, whatever, wherever you want to set that arbitrary threshold, if you want to do it by revenue or the fact that it's publicly traded or whatever, a certain number of your directorships are then uh, reserved for your employees. Um, so they're going to have a say in how this company is governed. And that, that really has two effects. Actually, before I even get to the effects, anyone that's offended by that is anti-libertarian. Um, your right to incorporate is not like some natural law, right? It's actually a franchise granted to you by the state, right? The, the state grants you a franchise that you're allowed to engage in business. You can have no personal liability at all for what your business does. That's what incorporation is. And you can have easily transferable ownership interests. That's all a bundle of privileges that you enter into a contract with the state to get that, right? And in exchange... You agree to pay taxes, you agree to pay an annual report fee, you know, a variety of things. It is quite literally a franchise. Uh, most states in the United States at one point, if not still, refer to their corporate income tax as a franchise tax because it's a fee or a franchise fee because it's a fee you pay for that privilege. If you don't want that privilege, you can operate a business in your own name and you can have unlimited liability for it. No one stops you from doing that. Um, this is a privilege that you've contracted for. So all I'm really arguing for on this point is uh, an amendment to that contract, essentially saying if you want that right to incorporate, you agree that once your business gets over a certain size, your, empl your employees are going to have a say in how the business is run. And that really accomplishes two things. Number one, on some level, this has been studied in Germany, on some level, it's going to lead to a, a less efficient business, right? Uh, some of the studies in Germany have shown that it's actually neutral. Um, some have shown that it's like up to a 20% reduction in uh, efficiency, depending on how they measure that. You know, I don't want to get into that whole thing right now. But by being less efficient, frankly, it, it favors smaller businesses and smaller holders of capital. I think that's a great thing. Uh, number two is it's naturally going to create a situation where people, uh, smaller stakeholders, they're not holders of capital per se in this situation, have a say in how their everyday life goes. Um, and that's just going to change the way that the business operates, frankly, right? Because it's not going to be a purely profit-making enterprise at that point. It's also going to exist on some level for the benefit of its own employees. And that's you, know, you can think that that's a bleeding heart thing. Um, so be it. Uh, I don't, and I'm, the thing I want to emphasize here is that I do not make the case that this is not, that the thing, anything that I propose in this, this conversation is a reduction in efficiency. I've read human action. I don't think anything in there is wrong. I don't really dispute anything in there. In fact, you just said it was a reduction in efficiency, right? That's what I'm saying. That's the point I'm making. I think that it is a reduction in efficiency, but yeah. I'm willing to take the trade off. It's a trade off, right? So you're yeah. trading off that for... Uh, quality of life, right? And say? I point out that one of the one of the points made in Human Action is that in the hand, I believe it's in the section on hampered markets. Do you want to look it up? Uh, no, no, I wouldn't kidding, be able to kidding, find kidding, it that quickly because it's like one, it's like a few sentences. I believe, if I remember correctly, one of the points that's made in Human Action is you know this is how things play out. This is how you maximize wealth. It doesn't really talk about efficiency per se. And here's what happens if you hamper the market. And then it says in there somewhere that's like, you know, if someone makes a decision to hamper the market, this this information is not is descriptive. It's not prescriptive, right? In other words, you just need to know what you're giving up if you're going to hamper the market. And that's why I think Human Action is, in fact, a, a very valuable book. I have no quibble with it at all. Um, I look at this sort of thing very clear-eyed in terms of what we're giving up. And it's extremely possible, for instance that with the type of stuff that I'm talking about, you're going to end up with a system where you cannot have any product from anywhere in the world shipped to your door in two days for no shipping fee. It is extremely possible that you are not going to get that. But to me, it's worth the trade-off, right? What, what is your ideal scenario? What, what is the ideal thing that we get out of this? 
the ideal is that we, you know, capital remains decentralized, which allows people to have uh, more control over their daily lives. They're not living in this servile relationship that I think would be the natural result of not doing things like this. And these are two examples, by the way, that I just, that I give, right? Um, I don't think there's a, the, these are only two examples of ways to use positive law to encourage decentralization. But the, my point in using those two is those don't cost anything. So there's no reason that, that, that those become impossible in a Bitcoin system, right? I mean, they, they have, well, if they cost something, the cost is very low from the government's perspective. So you can have sound money all you want. I don't think that those things are at all impossible to, uh, to finance. And frankly, you know, there are some natural, I'll really get people riled up now. There are some things that are natural monopolies, right? I, I, it's generally considered, for instance, that your utility company is a natural monopoly, right? That typically you're not going to have multiple utility companies run, willing to run lines to the same neighborhood. That's not something we've seen. Um, and in cases like that, I don't really have any problem with uh, uh, those types of entities being brought under direct government control and operated for the benefit of the people. I consider that a last resort because that is a type of centralization, um, which is usually what I'm against. But I don't think that anything's a perfect system. And, you know, if, if something's going to be a monopoly, I'd rather, if something has to be a monopoly, and we have no way to really decentralize it and create a competitive market, which isn't going to happen most of the time. But if that's the case, I'd rather it be a government monopoly than a private monopoly. I don't know, man. Is the government, well, private. Has private monopolies done a good job, right? Yeah. That's my, well, that's no, my well, point. I'm thinking particularly about the grid system now because I got freaked out about the grid system a couple of weeks ago because uh, I wrote a post about a dude who wrote a post on how to set up a block stream satellite. And he talked about how easy it would be to take down the grid system. Like in California and Silicon Valley it, years ago, there was like two snipers that took down six generators in Silicon Valley. And right. Like so those are, all, those are all private monopolies. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So what I'm trying to get is like the decentralization of the grid. Like, isn't, isn't the Texas grid like more decentralized and more, well, I guess, I mean, you can decentralize a grid in terms of the number of monopoly, the number of territorial monopolies, right? In other words, and I'm not opposed, I think if you're going to bring something under government control, I think that is the way to go to decentralize the grid. In other words, I'd rather have municipalities running your, uh, I strongly prefer a municipality running your grid rather than the state or federal government. Yeah, I guess Texas um, is that a te is that Texas's model? I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. I don't want to say that I know the answer to that question, but there, I mean, there are municip there's municipalities throughout the United States that do control their own grids. Yeah. Um, it really depends on the it depends on the area, right. uh, but you know, whereas say in California, P and G controls the grid in almost the entire state, right? So that, that's actually you made my point even better than I could. And this is an example where government control actually would ha be a it's a rare case where this would be the situation but it actually has a decentralizing influence because instead of one to one entity with total control over the grid, you'd have a bunch of different municipalities, each controlling their own section of the grid. Um, I'm sure cooperating with each other and also with, in terms of threats from overseas, cooperating with the federal government as well. Um, but it at least, you know, creates some level of decentralized control over there. So that's actually a pretty good example. Yeah. Um, you know, my philosophy on government is you want it at the lowest level possible, um, which, by the way, is fundamentally what would make uh, me incompatible with Marxism. Marxism is, a, by its own description, is a centralizing philosophy. The idea, is, I mean, Leninism is based around the idea of uh, democratic centralization, as they call it. You know, all decisions, you have diversity in I'm not a Leninist, so please forgive me if you are, and I'm mischaracterizing this. But diversity in thought, unity in action. In other words, democratic centralization is we all debate something, we vote on it. Whoever got, whoever lost out in this giant vote with this centralized, you know, uh, entity, they're just done. They've got to play along with the rest of us, you know, no questions asked. That's how, that's how Leninism works, and that's not what I would consider an optimal system, right? I strongly favor. I want to emphasize decentralizing a system and bringing all decision making whether it be uh, economic governmental etc to the sm to the lowest level possible one of the problems with distributist literature is it was written in a time where 
it was easier to do that because we weren't as industrialized, right? So one of the things uh, that's mentioned like in Chesterton's distributist works is this idea that, well, we could pay unemployed people in the cities to basically become subsistence farmers and give them land. Well, that was a good idea then. That's not going to work now. So I don't, I don't claim that those ideas are all bulletproof or that they don't need to adapt and change with the times, right? So my, I, I just consider it an ideal to strive towards. Not that we can be fully decentralized in every area, but we sh- that should be the goal. That's the first principle. No, I'd agree that's a good goal to strive for. Uh, makes everything stronger, more robust at the end of the day. But what I'm still trying to grasp yeah. over the many conversations that we had, distributism in general, and the way it's been framed, it, like, again, the trade-offs, efficiency um, for potential quality of life, and we've been talking about decentralization a lot. Does, does distributism impede emergent uh, action? Uh, what, what do you mean by emergent action? Well, because that's what I view like an ideal capitalist system is very emergent and just happens. You mean like new technologies? And, oh, or you mean just the, the idea that... Uh, Okay, I think like, I understand what you're competitiveness. saying. Competitiveness, yeah. Does it, does, it, does it allow emerging competition? Well, I don't. Well, th- here's the thing. My point is that's good. The that's a really good point. So, because this is going to tie into this is, I think, is going to clarify what I'm trying to say for a lot of people. Believe it or not, I consider the open market to be the first principle where we start. And then from a utilitarian perspective, we work our way back from that. So I don't believe the opposite. It's not like I believe the best thing is taking things out of market control. I generally believe the market is where to start and we work back from there in two ways. Number one, things where we should hamper the market. And I'll explain why in a second. And number two, I do believe there are certain things that just shouldn't be left to you know, uh, to the market at all. But <laughs> Okay. I uh, want to know about those. Okay, uh, that's that's no problem. That that this is a whole tour of uh, of controversial statements. So we'll we'll get we'll get there. <laughs> um, where was I going? Okay, so a hampered market, right? I do not believe in central planning as the ideal, right? You know, whether it's Soviet style or otherwise, because I fundamentally believe the market more efficiently allocates resources. But what I believe is it will, in fact, be so efficient if we don't, you know, forcibly decentralize it. Uh, It will, in fact, be so efficient that only one guy is, I'm exaggerating slightly, but one guy comes out the winner at the end, and now we don't have a competitive market anymore. Well, see, that's where where I'm hung up. Okay. Where you forcibly interject and, like, again, it reminds me of the fed trying to forcibly inject with the interest rates like how many negative externalities arise from that interjection right yeah and my point isn't that there aren't negative externalities i as we talked about when we were discussing human action i fully accept the negative externalities of it i just think it's better than the the alternative well what, 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 my point is like how do you know what the externalities are oh you're gonna have to find, you, you, you i mean I can prognosticate as to what they are, uh, and I honestly think that uh, we've talked about human action a lot is probably a really good uh, – that's a good method for prognosticating as to what they might be. But ultimately, you're right. I mean I could be completely wrong uh, about that's everything what worries I just, me, right? that I've just said. Yeah, but I believe the alternative is so much worse. This is like – I view this as a Flight 93 thing. Like if we – if that – you know, the alternative is that – well, two things. Number one – I view it as a Flight 93 thing. I don't think Flight 93 is a good analogy for this. Okay. I mean... I'm using the... Everybody dies at the end. Right. In but both scenarios. I'm referring to the Michael Anton essay. Are you familiar with it? No, 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 oh, no. Okay. No. okay. So oh. Michael Anton wrote an essay called The Flight 93 Election, where, if for those who aren't familiar, his argument was that... this I'm not endorsing any particular I just completely just assumed this, your... Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the Flight 93 election meant that his point was... Uh, he, the point he made in the essay is Trump might be terrible, but and we all might die at the end like we did in, like we did in that flight, but that your only option is to storm the cockpit. You know what I mean? Like you just, you don't have another option. You die either way, right? So why not storm the cockpit? So I consider everything that I'm mentioning here essentially to use Michael Anton's uh, 
uh, is it an analogy or no? It, it could be a metaphor, I suppose. To use Michael Anton's metaphor, um, I view everything I'm saying as storming the cockpit. Also, it's important to say, and I noted this to be in the piece. I don't even necessarily think that what I'm saying is prescriptive as much as descriptive. So in other words, if we have a system, capital is really centralized now, and it's only going to become more centralized as time goes on in a current fiat system, right? So let's assume that hyper-Bitcoinization is real and that it happens uh, in 10, 20, 30, whatever, whatever, whatever your idea of when that happens is. And the social democratic part of the system fails because of hi- because of hyper bitcoinization, right? Let's assume that. Well, do you really think people are just going to sit there and allow those centralized holders of capital to just sort of hang out, frankly exploit them, right, and not be providing the benefits that the prior social democratic system did? I don't think they are. I think that they are, in fact, going to either find another way to institute another type of quasi-social democratic system, which maybe they can get away with, maybe because they have, you know, so few, you know, you have so few competitors, they can get away with raising prices as a type of hidden tax, right, and then provide benefits to their own workers based on those right. Uh, rising prices, again, specifically structured in such a way that the, the workers themselves are not able to accumulate any sort of real capital, not enough capital to, frankly, compete with those existing large holders of capital. That's a possibility. I think Bitcoin makes it harder. The other option is something along the lines of what I'm talking about. You can think my ideas suck and still think that something that there's a better idea and i'd actually love to hear that if anybody has like i'm still trying to wrap my head around your ideas they don't i don't think they they're definitely very interesting and yeah. thought-provoking um and i get no and i get it decentralization as an ideal is something i agree with and i'm again i'm just trying to here's i guess my i point. can't i can't i just because i haven't thought about this enough i think a lot of people here's the, visualize here's like, what it all uh, comes down to it's do you believe that decentralization or centralization is the natural order of things. Which one do you believe? And you have to think about in the con- that in the context of industrialization. Yeah, but there's like a contradiction there, right? In your explanation. And what do you mean? What's the contradiction? Like if you believe it's decentralization and emergent, and then the hampering of of industry. Well, I don't think whether something's emergent doesn't mean it's whether or not it's decentralized. You could have a you could have a centrally, you could have uh, you could create an economic system enforced from the top, right? It's uh, no way around that. Uh, enforced from the top, that's designed to devolve certain powers down to. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I, yeah, yeah, I was wrong there. Um, no, again, again, and this this is purely probably because distributism is a completely new. After well, it's it, it, what's interesting about it. Concept too, to me, yeah. For anyone that thinks this is kooky, which is probably most, I want to make a couple points that are kind of in, that I find interesting. Number one, yeah, I mean, this is a, a tw- an early twentieth century. I well, really a late nineteenth century. The popes came up with it, right? As we talked about in the last podcast, Rerum Novarum was where it all started, which was a papal encyclical. By the way, I'm not an integralist. For some reason, distributism has sort of taken on this. Uh, this belief that you have to be an integralist to go for it. Integralism, for those that aren't familiar, is people that think that essentially the Roman Catholic Church should be integrated with the U.S. government. I don't believe that at all. I just want to kind of throw that out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, as a concept started with the popes, who really didn't give any concrete solutions at all, and then most notably Chesterton and Bloch in the early 20th century are the guys that started writing about solutions. The reason why you don't hear about Chesterton and Bloch is their ideas never really got implemented back then, partially because we had like world wars and all other kinds of stuff going on at that time. And because they were never implemented, they kind of got forgotten about. And if you go back and read the books now as to the specific solutions, it seems silly because it's, uh, it's, it was a more agrarian society then, right? Like th- these, they're just not going to fly. You have to be willing to read this stuff more at, more looking at as an ideal and having framework. To, Right, it's open land. It's oh, this is like blue ocean, right? In today's times, what's interesting though is these ideas are coming to the fore now, sometimes under the name of distribut- distributism, excuse me, sometimes not. Um, like I never expected. I'll give you one example. 
Um, this is not an endorsement of the sincerity of the person that I'm about to mention right now. Uh, one thing that was very controversial was Marco Rubio came out in November and said that he now considers himself a distributist. He's rebranding that way, I guess, for the next, for the 2024 presidential election, I suppose, right? And I, I, Only he knows if this is sincere or if it's political opportunism. I'm not, I truly do not mean to imply one or the other of those things because um, I just don't know. I don't, I don't know the guy. But the fact that a presidential candidate who's like not a fri- I assume will not be a fringe candidate for president in 2024 thought that this was a good thing to adopt show stuff like ideas like that don't get adopted if people don't get the get the feeling that that's the way the wind is blowing. Right. I think like that things like that show me which way the wind is blowing. That's just one example. And if you, fuck Marco Rubio, though. OK, that's fine. Uh, I, I, I just have a visceral hatred for politicians i think they're all completely fine you robotic no arguments here I, i'm not here i'm certainly not here to defend politics but i do agree it is interesting that he's it's just it's it right yes. I, that was my point i mentioned it only is that it's interesting that he found it necessary to do that interestingly uh he kind of he he did this at a, uh, in a speech in november and then he's written about it and it very much upsets a lot of people at you know uh I guess more some more libertarian conservatives that lean a little more libertarian were very upset by it. Um, but Rubio uh, tr- branded distributism as a reformation of capitalism rather than rejecting it outright. I just wanted to make. I thought that was interesting. Uh, I don't think that really means anything. It's just semantic. What 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 you where you think capitalism starts and ends. It was probably smart to do that. I mean, it's just because it makes it seem less radical, I suppose. And I could have easily, I guess when I wrote my piece, made it seem like uh, an evolution of capitalism rather than a post-capitalist idea or an anti-capitalist idea. But I decided to be a little more provocative. In addition to the the Rubio thing is the the most like punch it in the face, you know, uh, example of this, right? Wake you up that this is this is not something that people are adverse to Um, look at if you mess around on Twitter and look at where like political activists are on certain issues. Okay. On the right. So traditionally in the United States, we've seen libertarian ideas imperfectly. Of course, I'm not saying that, that that we have like a real libertarian Austro libertarian party in the United States or anything like that, but they've generally crept in on the right. Right. In other words, uh, Ronald Reagan certainly, I mean, a big part of his presidency was deregulation, open markets. Small government. Yeah, right. Uh, even even Bill Clinton uh, said that the era of big government's over, right? We've seen this in our politics. It's it's had strong influence on our politics. Has he signed NAFTA? Yes. But, you know, I guess, well, I won't even get into trade right now. But, because um, I don't want to get too far off my point. On the right, if you look right now, that Reagan type conservatism, uh, like among like, I'm not talking about just like your average, you know, what are sometimes called conservative ink people, right? In other words, people that run PACs or media celebrities or things of that nature. No, if you look at, if you take a look online, you look on social media, what the young people that consider themselves conservative are pushing, it ain't open market stuff at all. It yeah, is quite straight nationalism. Right. And in fact, the term they use, this is not my term. I'm just, this is observational is losertarian, right? Is what they call libertarians. Um, I don't use that term because I still think that uh, freedom is a good first principle, you know, individual freedom. And like I said, we work back from there. We don't look at that as a negative. It's just a first principle. I, when I say first principle and work backwards, I view stuff like that as the way I'm not a physicist. So forgive me any physicists that are listening for butchering physics. But the way I learned physics in high school was like you learned what worked in a vacuum. And that's like the way what I consider human action to be. And then like you make adjustments as necessary when you move out of the vacuum and into the real world. So uh, where was I going there? Oh, okay. Other other examples that you see in uh, of these types of ideas taking hold. Yeah, these people are very much not socialists, but also very much not uh, not open markets people, and they're nationalists. 
in the current globalized world, this is bizarre to say, but nationalism is a type of localism. I hope that's not the smallest level that we end up at, but it is in fact a type of localism. It very much is, which is a change from most the pre-global era, but that's where we are today. So that's one thing. And then look at who's the mo- who do you think is the most of all those stupid talking head shows that are on all the news networks, right? I'm assuming you don't watch any of them, but just things you hear secondhand, thirdhand, whatever. Who do you think the most popular one of those hosts is? Um, Tucker Carlson. Of course, yeah. right. Tucker Carlson is like the least open free markets guy on television right now. And I don't mean that negatively. I kind of, you know... I'm not overly political, uh, but I kind of get a kick out of some of these takedowns uh, that he runs on, uh, you know, various sort of corrupt crony capitalist systems. And that's where the energy is. That my, the, I only mention these things not as an endorsement of any of these people, nothing else other than the fact that the that's ideas the that I'm blowing. coming up with, there's energy behind this. Even if these people believe things that are different from me, they're believing things that are more like directionally in my direction that are then certainly... Uh, in the open markets direction. I never have in my life seen, in fact, so little momentum in the direction of open markets, partially because I, you know, my frame of reference is the 80s, 90s, and today. The 80s and 90s were the most free market era. I mean, they're the neoliberal era, right? I mean, free movement of labor, free movement of capital is what defined those eras, even into the first decade of the 2000s. Um, So that, I mean, just, again, just descriptive here, not being prescriptive. Put your finger to the to the wind and see where it's blowing. That's not the direction you know where this is going. One of my, I mean, if you need more evidence, one of just to go back to Tucker for a second. One of his direct quotes. Um, this wasn't. I used one of his quotes in the piece to sort of make this point, but this is not one of the two that I used. Um, was I'm paraphrasing. I'm not getting this exactly right, but was I used to be a libertarian, and for that, I'm ashamed and I'm sorry. Um, So, like, that's a hell of a statement. Whether you agree with that or not, different issue. I bring it up only as evidence of which way the winds are blowing as of today. That's it. No, again, merely descriptive. No, I mean, libertarians more recently particularly have uh, been derided for, for just being weak, like not uh, like the, the Nakamoto Institute versus the Cato Institute memes. Perfect example. Right, yeah. The, in, no action, um, not, not really implementing anything. Well, and I, but I think it's more than that, right? So like the, the Nakamoto versus Cato meme, basically the idea is that Cato is weak. They're kind of like tied into Beltway stuff. They're not real libertarians, etc. The energy I'm talking about is more so like you know, we people try- on the streets. Yeah, and it's more, and it's more the the idea behind it is, yeah, we tried this completely unregulated markets thing, which I know people will hate that I said that, but we let's let's say not completely unregulated. We tried deregulating markets. That shouldn't be controversial. I mean, if you look at the period between 1945 and 1971, and then you look at 72 to today, the markets were drastically deregulated. Um, that that's not even controversial and people are looking back and they're saying you know what that post-war period was a lot better um and that and that's where a lot of this energy is coming from yeah no it is it, i've been observing it observing it as well i mean i'm a fan of tucker i don't agree with everything he says but i do think he same here and my point this brings me to another point i mean part of my belief system and the things i'm talking about are because i believe the system between 1945 and 1971 was better than today, right? right. So, I, I, so describe I, that system. Well, you had a system where, well, part, I mean, the big part of it that we all know is we had a quasi-gold standard, right? So we, whether or not you want to say we had sound money in that period, it was sounder, it was soundish, at least until the it started to get out of control in the late 60s. Um, it, it became, the sound money aspects of it sort of became a sham in that period. But for a large part of that period, we had sound money. Another thing that I think is very valuable from that period, and this will be very controversial, is you, we had high levels of unionization. I am absolutely a huge fan of unions. And this goes back to the trade-offs issue. So the argument against that is, well, you know, unions get money, so they do things that are corrupt. They don't always act in the in the best interests of their members. I agree with... God. 
keep finish your thought. I agree with all of those things, 100%, but I think the alternative is worse. Uh, And the way I've seen that play out in real time, you know, heavily unionized country versus a non-heavily unionized country, I think the unionized way is is honestly the way to go. Um, And I think one of the big tragedies is the interest rate hikes of the 1980s just decimated unions in this country in a way to which they still haven't recovered. And that's, by the way, that's another th- thing cutting against, uh, you know, why part of the, uh, an argument against why fiat's so bad. It created a system where it was felt that we had to do those interest rate hikes in order to control inflation. And it had this horrible, it came at the worst possible time when there were mass strikes going on in the United States and just decimated unionization in this country. Well, to push back on that point, yeah, or and not to to push back and uh, thought ex- to in a thought experiment agree, yeah. Like I think uh, you're talking to to uh, to somebody whose whose family was built on unions. I mean, not my parents. My grand my grandfather was a union man. Both my grandfathers were. Um, in during that period you were right. describing, uh, but do we like do we need you like do we need bloggers unions? Like should bars no, actually have that's a union? kind of interesting. Yeah, like, my, so like, like my, we were saying, like it might be good for certain things to be monopolized in certain instances. I think with unionization, that might be like I think like steam fitters, pipe fitters, roofers, they make sense because their intensive yeah. jobs are actually building shit. Yeah, PMC unions are silly. So professional managerial class unions, in other words, people that are part of that class are silly. Uh, even like the, these journal, it's funny. Like one of the only things that the, one of the only sectors is how perverse the current system is in which unionization has had success recently as journalists of all people uh, have been successful in unionizing. You're right. I mean, I don't really favor per se, uh, believe it or not, I, I, I like to be as hands off with the law as I believe we can be. So I don't necessarily, I'm not like against specifically discriminating against those groups forming unions, but the unions that are actually helpful are, you know, your workmen's unions. And the, the best example of that, man, is I don't know if you've read about some of this Amazon stuff that goes on in these wor- in these warehouses, and it doesn't go on in every warehouse. I saw somebody talking about that. Apparently, people are just like pissing their pants running around or something like that. I'll give you one that's much worse. So Amazon sets its working conditions based on the labor, which all employers do this, but based in the labor of the labor market where it's located, right? So I'm not even just talking about wages. I'm talking about stuff like that. So in other words, like in their New York warehouse, they probably couldn't get away with making people pee in their pants, but they might be able to do that, I don't know, in Missouri or Ohio or whatever, Mm -hmm. right? So it gets so much worse. Um, Amazon, so obviously these warehouses are not air conditioned. Why would they be? That's, That's not how it works. But typically, if you you know if you work in a warehouse, what they do is when it gets very hot, they open the bay doors. Otherwise, you've got hundreds or thousands of people in the warehouse breathing, and it's just heating up like a box in there constantly. So they open up the bay doors. So Amazon doesn't like opening the bay doors because they think that it uh, employees can slip out with packages, they can steal stuff. So instead of opening the bay doors. They hired ambulances to just sit outside because they knew a certain number of people were going to collapse from heat exhaustion to just run in and get them and bring them into the ambulance. This is a real story. Like this was any, this isn't like they called the ambulance when the, when a guy collapsed, they knew hundred percent what they were doing. If those guys were unionized, that would not happen. Like, like you can criticize unions all you want. That ain't happening in, in, in a unionized workplace. I trigger a lot of people with this episode. No, but it is interesting to to have these yeah, these, I, these thought these, I these think, ideas battled out, and, right? And I and, think you know I've I've talked to since the since the piece came out, I've talked to a lot of people that are even so far as anarchists on this issue, um, and I've been really blessed in that no one's like tried to bite my head off or like taking it personally or anything like that. I've had for other you know people do that on Twitter, but that I don't take that seriously. Like more so. Uh, Friends of mine, right? Mutual friends of ours who consider themselves anarchists or minarchists or or, or, or austro libertarians or whatever, um, have certainly you know disagreed with me on a lot of these issues, but they haven't killed me over it. You know what I mean? So that's something that uh, I hope people also extend to you that same courtesy for having me on. Yeah, no, I think there's something. How many approaching his thirties? Who's uh, probably your 
typical trajectory of political uh, um, leanings through his life. More liberal when I was younger. Then I started getting paid, became more conservative, and found sure. Bitcoin anarcho capitalist. I've probably leaned towards these days and um, distribute again. Like the, when we had our first conversation, this this system that you're describing that revolves around decentralization or something it's just not talked about really right right it's absolutely the case because you know it's easier to control a more centralized system right so all the initiative if you're a, a stakeholder or you have real power in a society you know whether it be uh laissez-faire capitalism or or marxism are more uh beneficial to you because they're both easier to pervert Right for your own purposes because they're by their nature more centralized, um, and and we've seen that in uh, countries around the world. Right for the past hundred years, so a system like this is. I mean, I'm not saying you can't pervert it, but it's hard to do. Right because there's just way more people involved, and uh, and again, the power is being exercised at a much lower level. It's really a lot harder to get exploited by a guy who like lives around the corner and you see every day than a guy that lives 2000 miles away and has never met you. Yeah. The Nigerian prince. Right. Um, so how would you implement this? If you were to start, would you, would you have to get like a, would you have to have like California secede and break up into parts and one be like, Hey, no, I mean, I don't even think you need anything that radical. I mean, the, the, the stuff that I've talked about today, I mean, is not even really that big. Antitrust, you just need to start enforcing it. Like that's not, we already have that in this country. There would just have to be a political will to enforce it. Right. Um, so what would antitrust enforcement look like? Well, I mean, it's just a matter of, I mean, it's, it would look like exactly the way it was done throughout most of the history of the antitrust act up until like maybe, I don't know, the nineties, we stopped enforcing it. Um, so it's not like, I'm not even going that far back into ancient history here. Um, I think that that's in terms of how to implement these things, whether it's like, Antitrust, uh, you know, co-determination for companies over a certain size. Well, I mean, there's countries that have that already that are not like far-flung loony places. Um, Examples? Germany. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. We yeah. talked about that. Uh, uh, you know, what else did I mention in there? I'm trying to think of... Oh, unionization, that's easy. I mean, uh, card check was a major issue in the 2008 election. Barack Obama promptly forgot about it once he got elected, but that was... Uh, that was one that came car check for those that aren't aware makes it easier for workers to form a union currently in the United States. The way it works is um, if you want to form a union in your workplace, you have to get your employees to sign cards. Once over 30% of the employees sign cards, then uh, they're presented to the employer and there's an election essentially that goes place. And, and basically Sometimes hanky stuff can go on between signing. Once the election comes about, the employer knows about it. They can do some sketchy stuff to try to uh, dissuade unionization. If more than 50% of the... You don't have to stop getting cards at 30% of the employees. If you decide to go over 50% of the employees, you still have the election, but the employer has the option at that point to just scrap the election and voluntarily recognize the union immediately. No employers do that, right? Like in real world. Card check would basically just say if you get over that 50% threshold, the union recognition then becomes uh, mandatory. It's no longer voluntary for the employer. There's no election. You got over half of the card signed. It is what it is. Is that a perfect system? No, it makes it easier for the union to intimidate employees to sign the cards, right? Yeah, it's as very opposed, coercive. As opposed, to, as opposed to an election. Again, what do we talked about on this whole podcast? Trade-offs, right? And I think that that's... People can, I think, really well meaning people can disagree with me here, but I think that that's more than worth the trade off uh, that, that you're going to get more unions in that scenario. So it, part of it depends on whether you look at this deontologically versus you, in a utilitarian way as well. And I, you know, I fully uh, accept that. And I do not, I do not in any way think the stuff I'm talking about is utopian. It's going to have significant trade offs in terms of how it gets implemented. My hope, you know, a lot of, Listeners are probably uh, anarchists that don't believe in democracy or Republican government at all, and that's I respect that opinion. Um, in fact, I think it's completely reasonable based on the 
experience that you may have had with democratically elected Republican. Go- I'm, I'm using Democrat and Republican in the lowercase versions here, not the political parties that you may had with democratically elected governments and Republican uh, republics. Well, republics. The thing. Yes. Democratic republics. Let's say that. Yeah. That you may have had. My hope, I'm always an optimist, right? There's no use to being uh, pessimistic about this stuff, I don't think. Is that until now, we've had a couple things going on, through, actually throughout most of American history, right? One is in the United States, we've always had this idea um, that I, this is the best quote on it. This is a fake quote. There's an interesting history about behind this. Um, this is a quote that is attributed to John Steinbeck. He never said it. Somebody just made it up at some point, and I've heard a million different uh, versions of it. Uh, but the point is that there's there's no change in America because all Americans are temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Have you heard that quote before? I have not. Okay. So what it means is everyone in the United States, even if they're down and out, they hold the belief that this is just a bump in the road and that they're someday going to make it. That's what they mean by temporarily. That's what the meaning of that quote is by temporarily embarrassed millionaires. It's <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Gotcha. So the, uh, this is very closely tied to the bootstraps myth, meaning in the United States, if you're willing to work hard enough and do everything right, you can pull it up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The bootstraps myth is really interesting Um, I think about this a lot because there's an interesting duality there where with the bootstraps myth at the individual level, believing the myth is extremely beneficial victimhood, you know, uh, uh, believing yourself into victimhood doesn't do you any good, right? Even if the bootstraps myth is false, you come out ahead by believing it and doing your best and doing all you can to support yourself, right? So at that level, it's good. At the society-wide level, it's actually a negative because if everybody believes the bootstrap bootstraps myth, they're no longer motivated to electorally or otherwise make structural change that would be better for everyone, right? Because they are a temporarily embarrassed millionaire and they think that they're eventually going to come out on top in this system. So that's a really interesting duality that's, that's very much ingrained into the history of the United States, I, I would argue there. Um, What's going on, and for better or worse, because there are both, like I said, the bootstraps myth is both good and bad. Uh, I don't have a position actually on whether it's better or worse. I think it, I don't know. I, that's, I, one of the things I pride myself on is I'm always willing to say when I don't know whether, and I don't know whether that has a net positive or negative effect. But what is happening is the bootstraps myth is dying, right? I mean, less people believe in the bootstraps myth than did, uh, 30 years ago yeah that's yeah. like that's bad okay so like so that, like my problem with distributed or my understanding of distributism up to this point or yeah post-capitalist world too is like i think it just really um that's what i'm looking for it under um underappreciates the role that maybe like socially changing like telling people that you should be individually responsible. You should, yeah, like stay in shape, eat well, learn, like live a oh, learned yeah. life. Let, let, like I'll get to that. Let like me, maybe me... we should strive for that and not uh, trying to manipulate market forces to get an outcome. Right. The the reason you the everything you just outlined is the reason why I'm not a social democrat. Right. Okay. Because that's the worst system for in terms of personal responsibility. It really is. Um. And the reason I'm not the reason I'm not a social democrat is yeah, I'm not reason, trying to say that no. you're not personally responsible or anything. Like, no, no, no. Very, I didn't take it that way at all. You're very personally responsible. Yeah. Um, no, the reason I'm not a social democrat is for that reason, and the reason I'm not a Marxist is because I do believe that there's a natural hierarchy of people. So certain people are more talented than others, and those people should be encouraged and able and live in, and and be in a system where those talents are rewarded right like i don't believe in a completely flat system that's why i'm not uh i'm not a marxist however i think the distributed system is about trying imperfectly of course trying to take the best of personal responsibility and market allocation of resources 
versus the some of the more negative effects which create this more centralized system. And again, I think it's a Flight 93 solution where if you don't do that, you're not recognizing that capitalism is a transition period. In I don't like the 93 analogy. Okay. We I'll all die it. in the end. Right. But my point is you have nothing to lose. I'll, all right. I'll say it's a nothing to lose situation. Okay. okay. Uh, because that's what, that's what Michael Anton meant. So you have not, I don't think you have anything to lose because if you try to extend out this capitalist period of development as far as you possibly can, I think you end up with the servile state. I don't think there's any way around that. It's so, definitely happening. Yes, it's it's happening now, right? Yes. So, but that, I, that's my point. So I, in fact, but like again, I would argue that's the monetary system and not the economic system, right? That is a certain counter argument to to my point. I just don't believe that that I don't believe that it's enough. I think it's, I think it retards the centralization of capital. Well, like the, uh, like the. Uh, conservative nature through which we approach Bitcoin, or not we, uh, which Bitcoin core developers approach their development process yeah. in the world of transitioning economic mindsets, right? Like you, you want to, you don't want to raise the block size, so like going straight to distributism. Maybe, maybe you uh, interject sound money first, and then see how that. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not like I don't. I, got, I I don't know that I'd advocate for doing all this stuff tomorrow. Well, actually, you know what? I will push back on that a little bit for okay. a, for a couple of reasons. Um, one point I want to make about being conservative, like laissez-faire capitalism is like really new. Like we we tend to kind of like have this idea in our heads that like this has been around forever and it's the natural order of things. It is very much not. It is it is like a really new thing. We've had it in some very small periods. It's gotten us pretty far. Well, it depends what you mean by like, technologically. So do you think what do, What do you think was? Yeah, I mean that's an interesting point. Um, we you can you can think about it this way. Wasn't it the competition to move cotton around the U.S. led to the steam engine? Yeah, but that was a far. I, that this goes back to my point where actually let me rephrase what I said. Industrialization with laissez-faire capitalism is a very new thing. It basically goes to like the '90s. Like we're all we're like less than 30 years into this. Um, so my point is, here's okay. I'm going to make this well. A lot of the arguments against what I say here are that oh, like everything you want to propose is a market distortion, right? It's a distortion, a distortion, a yeah, distortion. That's what that's right. what's holding me up, man. Industrialization is a distortion, man. I'm proposing a far lower distortion to, if you want to say the quote unquote natural order of things, in terms of anything that I've talked about here today, than industrialization itself here is. I'm trying to correct, not even in its entirety, right? The only way to correct the distortion brought about by industrialization would be to deindustrialize, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to live on subsistence farms, right? But if you don't want to do that, then I don't have any problem at all with int introducing additional distortions to try and deal with the original one, because those are really your only two options, right? You could just let the initial distortion brought about by industrialization just run amok, and I understand there might be, uh, you know, good reasons to do that. But or not, the other is you 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 get in there and you start mixing it up with other stuff. I mean, well, I, the money, the distortion to me, the biggest distortion is the money, not industrialization. Now, I see. I actually disagree. Fiat currency is absolutely a distortion. Industrialization is a bigger distortion. See, I think that's where our, I think our disagreement huge. lies. Economies of scale just change so much. Man. It's a natural progression. Like it seems like you're trying to interject with nature. I'm not actually my uh, quite the contrary. My point was actually the opposite. It was that I don't think arguments about what's natural in terms of a market they're not persuasive to me because there's nothing natural about industrialization in the first place. So I kind of just reject all those things. What and, do you mean by that? Like, well, what do you mean by? I only know what other people. This is criticism that I get. This isn't my point. I don't believe that anything is natural about the way we live today. So, I, like, I, I just don't consider – that's not really a, a consideration for me when I – You think industrialization think is a distortion because the consumerism it produces affects our decisions? Yeah, and it it's central. I mean, people – the economy is a scale. I mean, predominantly through the economies of scale. If you just lived – Let's focus on an industry here, media – 
Uh, well, all those are post-industrial industries. So the reason this comes up, like I'll tell you where I'm coming from with this. Like the argument I always get against people. So some people like when I when I wrote this, I got a million things on Twitter. Well, nothing you mentioned would be the case about centralization if the government didn't exist. So my counter argument is always the vacuum, the power vacuum gets filled. We talked about that earlier in the episode, into this episode where we talked about how this the power vacuum just gets filled by collusion between the few remaining market players who create essentially a private government, you know, quasi-governmental entities, um, is always the power gets filled by a vacuum. And I, the point I always make is like history bears out what I say, right? In other words, anytime there's been too big of a centralization of capital, we've gotten either populist revolutions, including early 20th century United States that broke up. We had trust busting in the United States that, you know, that, that broke that stuff up um, or it just, you know, it just, it, it never happened. It never led to anything remotely considering, uh, remotely anarchist, even where there was, even where there was no government in place. And all the counter examples I would get from people were like, well, prehistoric Ireland, the Celtic tribes, you know, they didn't have, I, I'm not an expert on prehistoric Ireland. So if I'm misstating history, please forgive me. But like prehistoric Ireland is always an example I get. Uh, the Icelandic free state, which was also just like a really long time ago and pre-industrial is like the other anarchist example that I get. And by the way, I don't, you know, if you're an anarchist and you're listening, uh, my friends who are anarchists are listening to this episode. I'm not insulting your beliefs. I don't mean it that way. Uh, I'm just stating what I think is realistic here. All those, and by the way, I should also say that a lot of anarchists that I've spoke to to sort of steel man their side don't believe that perfect anarchism is realistic. They see it as more of an ideal yeah, to strive yeah. to rather well, than Well, that's real. the thing. Like, none of this is implemented, implementable right. in its ideal. So really what I'm saying, it, really what I'm saying here is like these, these pre-industrial anarchists or quasi-anarchists, or uh, another one I get a lot is um, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, right? Again, all pre-industrial. Most people like grew their own food and stuff. You know what I mean? Like this is not the world that we live in today. Those economies of scale have been completely turned on their head. Um, and that's why I just don't think those ideas from that era are particularly applicable to today. All I know is when I look back at history, uh, the most, the best example I can think of, for, you know, as an American in terms of like, uh, society is honestly that period from 1945 to 1971 and it wasn't perfect uh and it wasn't even necessarily distributist i mean the the federal government actually began to exercise a lot more power over that period but it it, it was a hampered market right and that's why i'm not against per se the idea of hampered markets i would like them to be hampered in a decentralized fashion rather than a centralized fashion and that's where i differ from that era but I'm just making the best, based on all available evidence, these are the conclusions to which I've come. No, yeah, that's why I wanted to bring you on to talk about this, because, again, I've said it many times throughout this podcast, it's just like an idea that I haven't, like, an I thought experiment I haven't thought about much or heard about much. What's interesting or, about it, what I've found talking to people, you know, we all live, including me, this is not uh, me ragging on you here. We all live because of the Bitcoin stuff in like a, an ideological bubble, like because I work in Bitcoin and you work in Bitcoin. So like uh, we uh, we we're around Bitcoin people like way more than normal people are. Right. And people that are very into Bitcoin and have been into Bitcoin for a very long time. So we get like a lot of the if you look at it from that prism, like the stuff that I've talked about on this podcast, I completely understand uh, sounds like wacky as hell, just like completely just really radical. The funny part though is honestly, I think if you put this stuff on a ballot in front of like ordinary Americans, I think you could get 60 to 70% of the people to agree with the stuff that I just said. I could be wrong about that. It's just the, the reactions I get from people outside Bitcoin versus inside Bitcoin. And I don't say that to say that the, to, to, to try to appeal to some sort of like popular authority that my ideas are right because more people like them. That's certainly a fallacy. Um, but I just kind of throw it out there as, as evidence that the stuff I'm saying is not that radical. And we talked about it when we talked about just sort of, you know, putting your finger to the wind of the way it's blowing right now. I think the stuff that I'm talking about for the first time in my life 
it's less radical than at any other time that I've been alive. Are you like, like whoa, what the fuck? People are exactly with me? the the Rubio thing. It was like me getting punched in the mouth because I was like not in a bad way, but it's just like the shock of it. When I read that, I was like, holy crap! Someone just said distributism on television. You know what I mean? <laughs> like this, like obscure, uh, you know, late nineteenth, early twentieth century thing. Uh, has somehow made it onto t- on a TV, right? You know, my whole, my era of being alive has been, you know, the neat, well, you know, I want, for me, the, what was the, the biggest historical influence, probably, I don't want to speak for you, but in your life at your age was probably September 11th. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Safe to say. I'm old, so for me, in my life, it was the USSR, the, the end of the USSR, and the consequences that that had. Because that, that was the beginning of the real neoliberal era. You can say it started with Reagan and Thatcher. But it was really... it. That's when it took off, man. Because we no longer had this threat of communism anymore. We could really deregulate without having to worry with short-term effects. That you know, The idea always was you had this welfare state system. Because otherwise, if people... if we did something that went wrong, people might start to turn towards communism. And that, rightfully so, was a really scary idea during the Soviet era. So in the Soviet Union, the point being, the fall of the Soviet Union in my life was the big event, man. Like that, it's hard to almost explain to younger people like how insane that was. because I have, you, I have no idea. Yeah, you had, you spent your whole life a free... When I say afraid of this foreign entity, you you weren't afraid of them the way you're afraid of ISIS. They were way more dangerous than ISIS, man. Like these are people that in the a little bit before I was born had nuclear weapons 90 miles off of Florida pointed at the United States, right? And even in the early 80s, the the later 80s like tensions really did start to decline, but in the early 80s were a tense time. Afghanistan, like there was a, you know, there was a lot going on. It's not something that you can really understand if you weren't living through it, even tenser than the issues with China today. No one really thinks there's a real probability that China would send nuclear missiles at the United States. Yeah, we're not having kids hide under their desks. Yeah, and I don't want to prov- give the impression that in the early 80s, like that that was a common thought, but it was like, it was out there. Like that, I mean, if you watch The Americans, that's actually a really good. Did you ever watch that show? Never got into it. No. Okay. Like if you watch the Americans, that's a really good Synopsis. feel of what the what living in America in the 80s was like um, in terms of the Soviet Union. And what was so insane about the fall, Marty, it was the blink of an eye. Like it was like 89 happened and you heard that there was like unrest and there were these protests in like Soviet bloc countries. And then by 91, it was done. It was like the, this this empire, this this unstoppable force um, was just gone almost overnight. Like it was just an unbelievable thing. And part of me feels that – so sometimes people talk about like, um, well, these changes that you mentioned, right? Like how realistic is it? And I always think back to, well – in 85 most people wouldn't wouldn't have said that the soviet union ending and and becoming a a capitalist country was realistic but not only did it happen like it happened like that like the the blink of an eye like i said you know what i mean so you know you always wonder like when when our 1989 is i don't know if there is one you know i I don't know could be starting right now and by the way when i say comparatively so that nothing I say is taken out of context. I am not comparing the United States to the Soviet Union. Like, let me be extremely clear about that. I'm making an extended, uh, you know, metaphor here. As I said, lest anybody think I have Soviet sympathies, my family came here in 1917 to escape the Soviet Union. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not. I wouldn't accuse you of having Soviet tendencies. You're just trying to yeah. describe the situation there. Yeah. Um, no, it is fascinating. And it does look like, seem like you're just genuinely exploring trade-offs yeah that's all it is and i I, you know a lot of and that's the thing like a lot of people some some like they'll read something that like i wrote and they'll say well like you know you must like have you read any of the austrian literature or do you just not get it or do you just reject it for some reason 
none of the above. Like, like we, like we've talked about with regard to human action. It's like, no, I think it's probably a pretty good description of human nature, the way humans make decisions, the way, the way markets work to the point where I think you could almost consider it a first principle, but I think you got to work back from there. Yeah. No, thank you for, um, it took us an hour and 45 minutes, but I think we did a good job. I think we covered a lot. Yeah, man, we didn't even get into I, I, uh, some of the spicier stuff I left off the table, so we'll, we'll have to do it. No, we have plenty of time. All right, well, I was going to say, uh, God, there were a couple things I think that I wanted to get into. Oh, like oh, you talked about how to implement these things. So another one of the more controversial uh, you know, opinions that I have is from a local perspective of a localist. Again, I approach everything from a localist perspective. Um, I do not, and I don't think this is contradictory with Bitcoin at all, and I'll explain why. I do not favor free movement of labor and capital. I just don't. I just I think that it, it creates a race to the bottom um, in terms of both standards for labor and environmental standards. And I'll give some examples. I'll try to steel man the counter argument against me here and kind of give some counter examples. Um, and I don't think that's incompatible with Bitcoin because Bitcoin allows money to move across borders seamlessly, but it doesn't do anything with the way physical goods or people move, right? And I don't do this to be heartless or or anything of that nature. I just think that the alternative is this. I'll give you a perfect example, okay? And I'm shaped, again, let me go back. Just well, I like to always disclose my biases. My life has been one where I started in the pre-Cold War era where things were considerably more protectionist. And I watched in real time, well, not the pre-Cold War, the pre the Cold War era. And then I moved into the post-Cold War era where we took those restrictions off and I saw what happened, right? Uh, and it has not been good. Um, now, in terms of... But we have iPhones and iPads. Yeah, and- exactly. That's the point. Yeah, we've... And, Look at and- this TV. It was only $200. That I was getting there. So here's the here's the idea. The counter argument against what I say, there's a couple. The first one is, well, trade tends to be looked at in this in terms of mutually beneficial exchange, right? Like if something's worth more to you than it is to me, we we make a trade, we both come out wealthier, everybody's happy. How could that be bad, regardless of what country you and I live in? Right? Like, how could that be bad? And it's based on this idea that people can make rational decisions when they buy, which I don't necessarily think is, I don't reject that outright. But when people make their purchasing decisions, I do not believe they consider nth order effects. And I'll give you the perfect example with the television. What I'm about to say right now is not a fully accurate description of things as they are, but it's meant to make a point. It's It's a simplification. So imagine you went into a store and... You could buy a an American made TV for three hundred bucks, or you could buy a Chinese one for two hundred bucks. Just imagine this world, right? And the American made television, all of the waste products are disposed in some sort of an appropriate fashion. Okay, the Chinese one they just dump it in the ocean, but you don't see that because you don't live in China. And also, like that, will forget about bleeding heart stuff. Just selfishly, what affects you, right? That is not going to affect you today, five years, 10 years, 15 years, but it might affect you like 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Halfway around the world, people are just dumping crap in the ocean, right? And then also the fact that I bought, let's assume, and this is not that far off, that the Chinese factory that's making that cheaper television, assume they're equal quality, by the way. The Chinese factory that's making that television, their labor standards aren't very good, so their cost of labor is way lower. Even just a, apart from how industrialized the country is, it's just it's an authoritarian regime. They're able to impose whatever labor standards they want. People don't have the ability to strike or without threat of violence, let's say, based on their working standards. So they're living as slaves or quasi-slaves, right? And this is not too far off of where things are today. So when I go to buy that television, who, who, which television? Uh, so that's, excuse me. So they're, obviously their cost of labor is lower, right? So aside from the environmental thing, by me buying that television, my next door neighbor who works at the television factory in town, right? I've contributed to just a little bit 
to the fact that eventually that factory is going to close. He's going to be out of work. And his lawn's going to get overgrown. He's going to stop paying his mortgage. Again, this is not a bleeding heart thing. Just looking at it selfishly. He's not going to be able to pay his mortgage. And now the value of my house is going to go down, right? So even if I'm looking at this completely selfishly, the Chinese TV, the Chinese TV if I'm looking at everything all down the line, the Chinese TV is not the better deal. It's horrible because if I buy the American TV, my property value stays higher. My kids aren't going to have to deal with like fish with five eyes and stuff like that, right? Like this is, this is the way to go. But that's not how it works. Like we know this. Everyone buys a $200 television. Uh, the American television factory goes out of business and that's how that's, – that's exactly how things go. Because when you're making – and that trade was mutually beneficial in the short term. Like you you did, you actually, even though that purchase was not in your material self-interest, that doesn't matter because you believed it to be so at the time because these nth order effects were too far down the line for you to reasonably consider when buying a television. That's a factor of human nature. Like you can't tell me that that's not how it works. So that's that's one of my issues with free trade is if we don't have tariffs to equalize that sort of thing, or frankly, I don't think we should be, this is not something that can be implemented at all overnight because we're so intertwined now, but we should not be trading with China at all. We should have never uh, implemented normalized trade relations with China. Yeah, the Huawei 5G thing sort of freaks me out. Huawei. Huawei, whatever. Yeah, yeah. so, right, that's another example. By trading with China, we're, we're like harming our own security interests. So none of these things get considered in a purchase decision. So I have no problem at all enacting uh, tariffs or trade restrictions to rectify that issue. And it's just one of those things where, you know, I live in the real world and like this is how the real world works today. And uh, and now, by the way, going back to Bitcoin. Wait, wait, so, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Before we get to Bitcoin. Yeah. Jeff, are you a racist Nazi? <laughs> right. That's always the – exactly. That's always the thing. Well, the term now that they like on the internet for people that – I don't know if you're familiar with this term – that say these sort of things is you're a Strasserite. I, I've gotten that one before. Are you I've familiar with that term? Yet, no. Okay. So uh, we'll, get, we'll do a little bit of history here. So the National Socialist Party in Germany, right, the Nazis, okay, were not – in Hitler's – the time that we think about when we think about the Nazis, they certainly were not Marxists, okay? Like they weren't really socialists. So one of the things people oftentimes ask is like, why is socialism in the name? That really wasn't like a part of what they were doing, at least in the time period when we think about Nazi Germany. And the reason is there actually was a socialist current within the Nazi party early on. They were the Strasser brothers, were the two brothers that uh, supported that. So it was basically like, it was like a racist worker based party. If you wanted to sort of like, like they definitely hated Jewish people and I'm sure would have done the Holocaust too. Um, but they looked their antipathy towards Jews also had like this weird, like worker based component to it. Right. Like the Jew as a worker, the Jews are, are the, the your problem. Like they're the ones exploiting you. Uh, so this is, let me be clear. This is a hideous ideology, which should be roundly condemned. So anyway, when Hitler got enough power within the Nazi party, he expelled the uh, the Strasser brothers. They went into exile. I forget. Actually, one of them might have been killed and one of them went into exile. I don't remember the, the history. I think Otto went into exile. I forget the other guy's name. He was killed. So when you call someone a Strasserite, you're basically calling them both a Nazi and a communist. Like it's the com- it's the combination. Yeah, that's a bad combo. Yeah, that's so. This is sometimes referred to as Strasserism. Sometimes it's referred to as red brown politics. Brown being the color of the Nazi of the Nazis. Red being the color of socialism. Uh, it's also sometimes called beefsteak. Uh, politics because you're brown on the outside and red on the inside. Um, so that's those are all the various slurs that you, you can uh, sometimes expect to get. Um, yeah, and obviously nothing I have said here today is meant in any way to uh, endorse the idea of an ethno state or anything even remotely in that ballpark. At any rate, um, no, 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 but that's what people jump to when you bring exactly. That's right? a conclusion people jump to, and I and part of the reason why that conclusion is jumped to. Remind me to go back to why that conclusion is jumped to, because that's a whole other interesting thing. 
Okay. Where were we before I got off on this Strasserite thing? Because let me finish my. You were going to get into Bitcoin. Okay. Let me finish that thought really quickly, and then I'll go right back. I okay. Promise. Okay. So another thing about Bitcoin is it does make these wild trade imbalances like that we see between the U.S. and China impossible because those are dependent on fiat money. Um, basically, essentially, you can only run such an insanely huge trade deficit when you have fiat money that you're printing and then its value is being supported by the other country reinvesting the money into your financial system, which is why we've had financialization in the United States. So that's another reason why I support Bitcoin. It does help the problem to some extent. I don't think Bitcoin solves this problem for good. I still think that there would be a race to the bottom in terms of uh, labor and environmental standards. To jump back, uh, why do these slurs come out? Why is every, why do all of these seemingly non-racist people like get branded as racists? You haven't answered the question yet. Are you racist? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So that's a funny, like, the funniest part about that is, like, when you talk about these, like, I'm, like, an almost native-level Spanish speaker. Like, so, like, it's weird to accuse me of, like, not having been around the world or having some sort of animus to developing countries. I love the developing world um, and, and have spent a lot of time there. At any rate. Why? I'm sorry for it's okay. forcing you to. It's, it's, it's all right. I didn't mean to. I was joking. It's all right. No, I know that you were. I didn't take it personally. Um, like, why do we see this? Because it's a great grift, man. It is a fantastic grift. Because it's easy, right? Here's the deal. This is why everyone wins, other than average people. When when you make that the locus of how you look at the world, right? So. Let's say you look at the world the way that I do, like as a distributist, or even if you look at the world as an orthodox Marxist, right? Someone who has a class-based, not identity-based politics. If you look at the world that way and you look outside and you see something that you consider unfair or that you want to change, what's your natural inclination going to be in terms of how to change that? It's going to be some sort of structural change, whether it could be communism, it could be distributism. It could be making the market even freer. You know what I mean? Like all those things are structural changes. Okay. If you're someone that's doing really well in the current system, that's bad for you, right? Like, which is includes all of our largest corporations currently that control all of our media, right? And that sort of propagate this identity-based politics. So how can you get people's focus off of that? You move the focus away from class and you say, this is really based on race. If we all weren't so racist or we all weren't so sexist or we all weren't so what or homophobic, we wouldn't have these problems. All these problems that you see really come from discrimination. That is a more valuable – by the way, this is not me denying that, that, that real discrimination exists. I want to be clear about that. Um, but if you internalize that as the lens through which you see injustice or inequality or whatever you want to call it, then you don't focus on structural change at all. You maintain the current structure, but you just want to make sure the occupants of the different positions within that structure are more racially balanced, which is better than it was before, right? But I'll give you a, a, a clear example. If you have an econ a fake economy, I'm just making up an economic system where there's 1,000 slots for people that can be successful and then there's like you know 5 million slots for everybody that just kind of gets by, right? So if you're using a class-based lens to look at the world, you're going to say whether you're an anarchist, a communist, or anything in between, uh, you're going to look at that and you're going to say, damn, let's like change this so that it's easier to move between that 5 million and the 1,000 and then maybe like change the numbers or, you know, of, of the breakdown. Let's say that 5 million and 1,000, it's really hard to go back and forth. When you're in that 1,000, like you're there forever. And, you know, like it's really hard to get out of there. New slots don't open up very often, right? This is a simplification just to illustrate my point. But if you use a race or class-based, I mean, excuse me, a race or gender-based lens to look at that, what you're going to say is, oh, like this is fine. We just need to make sure that more people of different races are in that top 1,000, which does not help any particular race on the whole. Because even if you're, 
a member of an underprivileged race in that system, you might only get a couple extra slots in the in the you know in that system. Whereas if you made the whole thing better and there were more slots, period, a rising tide floats all boats in that scenario, right? Like you, like more people of your uh, of your race are going to ultimately benefit. And in terms of what I'm saying here, like if you want to like read more about these ideas. Um, you know, from a Marxist perspective, Adolf Reed is really good. He's an African American um, professor at the University of Pennsylvania, um, who is I, I don't know that he, he's not I don't know that I, I don't, maybe I'm mischaracterizing him as a Marxist, but he's certainly of the left, um, and kind of explains that. Which even if you're not of the left, I think is an important and valuable tool to remember when you see these sorts of uh, you know identity based ideologies that are specifically designed to inflame people divide divide people right why does that exist well the reason it exists is because it's in the material interests of the people at the top to do so and none of this means that uh people shouldn't fight discrimination or anything of that nature i do not mean to imply that it means that the more effective way to fight discrimination is to start with uh you know a class-based approach or a broader based approach um, and, and, you know, address individual discrimination as it comes. Really, that's, that's the way to, to handle that sort of thing. No, I, mean, I completely agree. And it's crazy how it's almost taboo to have this conversation today. Yeah, I'm gonna, I, 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 part of me, like when I went in here today, I kind of thought like, you know. Why is it a, taboo? I had a conversation uh, with, uh, well, one of our mutual friends on Friday night. You, you'll remember, I don't want to dox him. About like self censoring. I don't know. Were you there for that? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about self censoring, and I kind of thought today I was like, man, how much do I want to self censor just to like not piss people off? Like, and I just kind of, the more we talked, the less the self censoring stuck in. So uh, yeah. No, you shouldn't self censor. I mean, it, that's, it is what it is. Hopefully, that's what this podcast offers to my guest is a place where you can feel comfortable. And I'm here, gen- like. I just genuinely want to explore these ideas for ideas sake and exploration sake. Like, yeah. And I appreciate that. And I, you know, I hope that people that are listening, like don't think that like I'm attacking their ideas or I think they're bad ideas or that it's in any way a personal thing. It's just my only goal on coming on here was to sort of give you another way to think right that doesn't even necessarily conflict with the principles laid out in for instance a lot of austrian literature it's just a different a different way to interpret it and act on it really in my opinion um at the end of the day and you know you might not come around to my way of thinking uh I've, since that piece came out there are a great number of people who have not come around to my way in fact i don't i think probably most but you know what there are there have been some exceptions. I'll give you two examples. Well, two things about that. Number one, I had a small number of people like that wouldn't tweet about it, but would DM me and say, Hey, like, I really agree with this, but it really scares me to say this. Name names. No, not I'm, kidding, names. I'm, I'm not, kidding. I'm not to say this out loud. And I had someone else said something to me really interesting on Friday. Again, I'm not going to dox anyone. But they said, yeah, they said, you know what, like, I've spent most of my life as a libertarian. I still believe in those ideals. Uh, I worked for Ron Paul in 2012. Like, I don't know that he meant worked as in he was in, worked for the campaign, but he did whatever. He canvassed. He was, he was part of Ron, the revolution, baby. Yeah, it was like a Ron Paul voter, right? And I, and I think those are great people that have really great ideals. Um, and he said, yeah. And I read your piece and I thought about what has happened, you know, recently and he, he said to me, he's like, I'm really coming around on some of those ideas. And he gave a very concrete example where he said Christmas just happened. And I looked at all of the plastic trash that I threw away after Christmas. Like literally he was talking about like not only the wrapping paper and packaging, but like single use toys and things like that. And I was just like, I was just disgusted. Those, those were his words, right? And I think to some extent consumerism of that like hyper consumerism is just sort of a natural unfortunately evolution of the later end of the of the capitalist stage of development i think it has to be because you run out of things to monetize so you got to come up with more and more crap 
to to sell people trinkets baby no yeah. i get i've been getting pissed at my mom the last two years she's like send me a christmas system like i don't want anything like i don't need anything i try to live in this st- studio apartment and those are good ideals man those small. are you know there's nothing wrong with that well i you know there's nothing wrong with that well those and the other thing I- too is like what really appeals to me uh with distributism and more localism is again like here in Brooklyn and Williamsburg, the mecca of woke capitalism, probably behind San Francisco, yeah. one of, one of the one of the capitals of woke capitalism. Uh, like we have the like the paper straws. It's not going to yeah. do shit. Like and like especially us here in the first world. Like I saw a video on Twitter. Uh, I don't know what country it was, but like people are just backing up dump trucks and literally just dumping it into the ocean. Like we're not going to be able to control that. Like, Correct. That's the plastic straw thing is like a great example because. Uh, well, we can, amount, con- we can control that with localism, right? right is exactly. the argument you're making. Right, exactly. And that's all that we can do um, because we can't control what's going on in China. They're eventually going to have to wake up to that, you know? And one of the ways that we can get China to wake up, this is what goes back to my trade thing. If it's a condition of trading with them, like I have no, like, uh, no um, qualms. hesitation, right, or qualms about using trade restrictions as a way for some of these issues that are global, right? Like pollution, unfortunately, does affect us all. Uh, you know, China dumping plastic in the ocean affects yeah, us this all. This is like we, we talk about the uh, the coastal town that we grew up in a lot. Yeah. Like, I care about the ocean. I care about beaches I deeply. And that's like the funny thing, especially uh, like I had Dave Kalamon. He's like a uh, climate denier now. And he made some very good points. And people yell at you if you like if you – not not even straight up deny climate change, but say, hey, maybe these politicians screaming at you have ulterior motives and they try to paint you like you hate the environment when actually at the end of the day, I was the kid picking up trash on the beach after people would, all the shoebies would fucking leave. Yeah. And and like working at the hot dog stand, like I would pick up all the trash on the, on the, on the beach pass so that it wouldn't go into the ocean at the end of the day. Like I care about the environment. It's just like, I don't think we're approaching the, the problem in the right way. Yeah. And that's an interesting point in that, um, opinions on issues like, like that's a classic example. I think pretty much everyone would agree on what you said. And that's why I think, you know, left, right distinctions are sort of almost meaningless today. Uh, they're just sort of intentionally just, designed to uh, divide people over cultural issues. And I think that they're less meaningful almost than ever, right? Because in turn, you know, uh, you know, like you, hell, I mean, the Democratic Party is pretty free trade today. You know what I mean? So like, I, I don't, I don't really, th- and that's not really a traditional left position, at least not from the 20th and early 21st century. So it's more, I think this whole like left, right thing is more, uh, it's a sideshow. Yeah, it's more of a sideshow than anything else, it's right? A, it's and a distraction. Case in point, everything I've said here today, I think average people would say that I'm on the right, I think is the idea. And I think like to the, if this is like an Austrian Bitcoin group, they probably think I'm like a communist. Or a statist. The, yeah, right, on the far left. My, Mises so, would certainly call you a socialist. Who would? Mises, excuse me. Yes. Of course, well, they use a different definition of the term, right? Like they use the for, the term from... I'm always embarrassed when I say Mises. From, uh, I just look at the book and I just say, I'm sorry, Mises. Yeah, no problem. They, they tend to use the term from... Um, Mises Institute guys tend to use the term the w- the way they define it, which is fine. I don't have any problems with that. I mean, under that definition, essentially, every real world economic system that we've had n- falls into that socialist camp, right? And they, I don't want to speak for them, would typically most most people that I've met that identify that way would want to move away from that. And I think that's sort of like their whole their whole point. Yeah. Yeah. Very fascinating. All right, now we're over two hours. Okay. My wife's about to come home, so I think we got to wrap this up soon. But again, thank you. It's been very fascinating. And, and again, I'm still exploring this stuff. When people ask me, like, what, what are you, what is your political ideology? Honestly, I'm like, ah, I, don't, ah, I don't know these days. Yeah, and well, a little it, bit of everything. There's like a within Bitcoin to and do I have do I not have conviction for not knowing? Like, no, a not at all. That's actually that? the point I wanted to make. Like, so among people that tend to be in, I don't want to say in Bitcoin. Cause what, what does that even mean? But among people that tend to be into Bitcoin, I mean, one thing you'll notice is uh, like a disdain for political solutions. 
And that's fine. I mean, that's a that's a political ideology itself, right? I mean, that, that, that's probably what I trend towards. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's a, like I don't. Uh, I certainly would never like denigrate someone for holding that position. Um, I don't only because I'm like an all of the above person, right? I'm happy. I to me. Uh, any work that I would do on Bitcoin or any involvement in Bitcoin, I'm not diverting any time away from that by, for instance, voting, right? Like it doesn't, you actually, believe it or not, like it's not a, I don't want to say believe it or not. It's not a binary. You can actually like spend a little time deciding on how you want to vote and then going out and vote and not spend 24 seven on Twitter arguing about politics, right? Like you don't have, like I understand completely that if you get like really personally involved in politics, you start to take it personally. You watch all the cable news shows, and you argue about politics on Twitter. It's is that nauseating, man. right? Or, or, or even beyond just nauseating, is that diverting you from more productive pursuits? Of course, right. But there is a way that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't ha- that you should like not vote at all. Again, not denigrating anyone that chooses not to vote. That's a perfectly valid decision to make. And in fact, if nothing meets your ideals. Uh, or you don't even think anything is close enough direct any everybody that votes I mean no one's voting for exactly what they would consider ideal but if you don't think there's anything even close enough or directionally accurate to where you want to go to vote by all means don't vote I mean I would never encourage someone to vote that has conviction to not vote but my only point is I don't think just because like I, so, I think some people almost feel that because they're into Bitcoin like you know, uh, that they shouldn't vote, but it's like, no, like if you want to vote, vote. If you don't want to vote, don't vote. But like the fact that you're, that you consider Bitcoin an apolitical or post-political or super political solution, I don't think it necessarily has to logically follow that you shouldn't vote at all. That's just my opinion. Yeah. You're talking to somebody who doesn't vote. Yeah. And I, you know, we've talked about that before Yeah, and that's, that's fine. Yeah. It is, it is what it is. And, um, yeah, maybe I'll vote in the future. I don't know. Again, I don't, I don't think I've been thoroughly convinced. I would have voted for Ron Paul if I was old enough God. the first time around. I can't believe you're that young. It's yeah. scary to me, man. Uh, dude, you're closer to my parents' age than my age. <laughs> that freaks me out. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are young. Yeah, that's right. We've had this discussion My parents before. are born in the late 60s. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah man. Well, fuck. We were, I wanted to talk about BTC Pay and Lightning implementations with you, but... I don't know if we have time. Yeah, well, we'll do it another time. Yeah, we will. I'm sure I'll be back. We got plenty more to talk about. Um, final notes? Just, uh, you know, uh, yeah, actually, I do want to give a, like a little final short soliloquy here without going too far and okay. adding two more time. Just, you know, like I fully understood that like when I went on today, uh, a lot of the stuff that I talked about tends not to be the perspective on political economy that most people that are subscribing to a Bitcoin podcast have. Um, it's kind of why I decided to do this. I thought it would be interesting. Um, and, you know, I just hope people take it with that spirit. I'm not attacking anyone's beliefs. Just kind of throwing out there. This was the spirit of what I wrote, too. Uh, what I think. And then, you know, I think it, at least at some level it's useful because there are some people out there, obviously in the mainstream that have ideals that are similar to mine. And, you know, I maybe I hope that some of them will see Bitcoin as a way of advancing those ideals. I, uh, I agree for you, for what you just said, particularly Bitcoin can definitely help with what you're, you're trying to accomplish. I would love to have a sit down between us two and Tucker Carlson to go over these ideas. (laughs) Yeah, that would be awesome. Like that. I've been waiting for like the Bitcoin episode on Tucker's show, but like it hasn't happened yet. Like I, for a while, I've been like, I think there's going to be a Bitcoin episode here. I think we, should, hey, freaks, let's meme that. The Bitcoin episode, episode, Bitcoin episode should be Tucker coming on this podcast first and having a conversation <laughs> with Jeff and me, and then we'll go on his show. And and actually, you know what? 2020 is an effort to uh, to get more outside the Bitcoin bubble. Yeah. Um, so we'll go on his show first. Go on his show first. All right, yeah. Tucker, if you're listening, I know you are, because we're going to tag you in this tweet. And I think you're going to like this conversation. Plus, you, you you go on his show. He's got millions of viewers. Think of all the new downloads. That's yeah, true, true. Big pump, big pump there. All right. We're going to stew on that for a little bit. We're going we're gonna to figure out how we're going to craft a tweet to get uh, Tucker to respond to To get his to attention? Us. Yeah. All right. I'm all in, man. Well, thank you again for coming by. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Peace and love, freaks.
Take care.